This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at Kevin Kautzman and at Brad Kelly. You know, the, <laughs> it's the Kubrick, Kubrick episode. Kubrick day, baby. It's Kubrick I've been waiting day for this one. On uh, Art of Darkness, artofdarkpod.com. I'm Kevin Kautzman. This is Brad Kelly. Brad, how are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm really, I'm really stoked to talk about uh, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, glad I also didn't have to do any prep for this, so that's cool as well. Uh, I'm hard at work on my own uh, upcoming episode, but I'm, I'm thrilled. This, this one, uh, for me... For whatever reason, maybe because it, it feels so personal, because I'm such a huge fan, uh, and he's not that far away, feels somehow mm-hmm. more daunting than some of the others. Uh, yeah. his, his people are still here. Right. They're still working on making sure his, his legacy is sound. I had the pleasure of seeing the wonderful Kubrick exhibition at the Design Museum in London a couple of years ago. If you ever get a chance to see that, it's incredible. You get to see the 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 uh the sexy what? lady statues from a clockwork orange you get to see the carpeting from the shining you get to see the uh, so is that what it is it's like stage uh, it's like production design kind of stuff or yeah it's yeah. it's the That's masks cool. from eyes wide shut well uh, he had so many iconic things uh, really. unreal and you don't yeah. even realize it until you look back in retrospect at just how iconic the objects are in the in, in the films, how design is central to the to the films, and I will do my level best to do this justice uh, and to keep it under ninety minutes uh, because there's so much to unpack. That day that I was at the design museum, uh, I got to see Jocelyn Pook and her ensemble, which to me was an absolute bucket list thing that I didn't even know was going to happen. I got so lucky. Uh, I, she did the music for Eyes Wide Shut, the famous sort of chanting music, and then the the music during the orgy, and, and her ensemble was there, and I just happened to be there the day that they... Oh were performing and I got to see them warm up. I mean, I am a, I am a real serious Kubrick fan, but I've never uh, until now taken the time to read some biography, dig into it. Uh, I have a, a reference book here that I think I'm going to dig into. There's, there's going to be a lot of like me reading uh, during this episode. So I hope that's okay. Um, the biography that I'm referencing is uh, Vincent Labruto, uh, Stanley Kubrick, a biography. And it's pretty, you can see it's pretty thick, uh, oh, yeah. pretty definitive. Um, and uh, I also have a New York Times article uh, which is something to the effect of, let me look now, look now. It's, it's called What They Say About Stanley Kubrick. So uh, it's interviews with uh, Christine, uh, Christiane Kubrick, Tony Curtis, Sidney Pollack, John Milius, uh, Jerry Lewis, etc. So we'll, we'll uh, cool. sprinkle those in. Structurally, this episode, because this, this man was uh, a workaholic. Yeah. Work was his, his life, and he didn't take generally didn't take vacations. Uh, This is a guy, I think, whose life was kind of a a vacation from the real. Uh, He coordinated his life so that he he could work on work on films. Uh, And when he he did take a vacation, I'm kind of skipping around now, we'll get into the meat of it here in a minute. But when they did finally take a a vacation after Lolita, uh, they went to see the uh, the something about D Day. They went to go see the like the foxholes or the or the the machine gun. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Like, oh, what a lovely vacation! Yeah, uh, we're gonna go to uh, Normandy and and yeah. see the see the sights. You know, so this was this was a very serious man, a very serious artist, and I think um, both for people who are fans of the film, but also for for those who are artists themselves or aspire to some sort of art. I hope this episode will unpack 
someone who I think inarguably uh, was a genius. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no ambivalence there. Like whether you love or hate his films, because his films can be very divisive. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any question that we're dealing with an auteur uh, and a genius of, of the highest order, probably one of the, certainly one of the greatest geniuses of the cinema. Is that oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I've I've always kind of, even though I I don't even know that any of his films I I don't even like favorites. So I'm, I'm not even going to say what I was going to say. But he, he does. He's to me, he's always sort of been like the William Shakespeare of cinema, basically. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of um, cineasts will disagree, and they'll go even deeper, yeah. and they'll have their other their other favorites. But I just don't, I just don't think you can argue there's anyone who's really fundamentally greater than him, who, who tackled a more diverse array of subject matter. Every film has its own vernacular, its own mm-hmm. mood, its own language, but it's all distinctly Kubrick with that charcoal wit and that, that insight into human nature. Um, so, so Brad, we begin every episode of Art of Darkness with uh, a question, which is, what do you know about uh, Stanley Kubrick? Uh, I, you know, this is one I do know a fair bit about, not clearly not as, as much as you, but, uh, you know, an amazing film director, um, career stretches all the way back to like practically the golden era with Spartacus, I believe is the first thing maybe uh, he directed. Spartacus was the, the first major feature film that he directed. He was brought in because he had already directed... Uh, the uh, killing paths of glory and oh. the killing and okay. killer's kiss prior okay. to that. And we'll, we'll pick all this up. Okay. Uh, but he was brought in, I think after one week of shooting, they brought him in um, because uh, Kirk Douglas was, I think producing Spartacus as well. They brought him mm-hmm. in to work on Spartacus. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So it yeah. was mm-hmm. stretching all the way back to then and then ending in uh with eyes wide shut in the late 90s so you know basically contemporary for you and i anyway Mm -hmm. uh and you know just a regular just a murderer's row of of films between the two essentially each Mm -hmm. one it's sort of its own genre almost so yeah yeah and genre genre defying or Mm -hmm. uh, defining and or defying is there yes. another film that's that's like clock a clockwork orange? Not really. No. There's no other really. I'm sure some people will say okay it's like this 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 and this sure. Yeah. Uh, but it stands on its own. It is its yeah. own unique contribution to cinema and we'll get into a clockwork orange. Good. Uh we're going to get into all of it and Good. um I'm so excited about it. What do you what do you know about Kubrick's reputation? I, I know all I really know was that he was an obsessive and he was a bit reclusive. Like it was difficult to get interviews with him or anything along those lines. Um, and that because he was an obsessive, he was a little bit hard to work for or with. There is a, there's a fine documentary that his family uh, clearly curated, uh, mm-hmm. which argues, they argue pretty strongly. He was not a recluse. Mm. Uh, he just didn't talk to the journalists in England. Right. And so they resented yeah. that. Yeah. And, so make it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a bit of a side story we'll get to here too, about a fellow who uh, pretended to be Stanley Kubrick for years. He would, <laughs> he would eat out in London on pretending to be Kubrick. <laughs> Hey, I mean, uh, that's a that that's the that's the kind of celebrity to pick, right? You say that you're J.D. Salinger, you say that you're Thomas Pynchon, you know, like <laughs> yeah, somebody really obscure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Twitter famous. Yeah. Well, so let's get into it. Uh, there's so much to unpack here, and I'm going to try to make it a good episode. Uh, I'm really excited. I've been I just finished uh, finished watching uh, one of the early movies. Let's let's really dig in. Uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, was born on July 26th of 1928 and uh, was an American film director, producer, screenwriter, and photographer. Uh, Frequently cited as one of the greatest filmmakers in cinematic history. I don't think it's an argument. Uh, One of the things about his films is is that they were mostly uh, adaptations. Uh, He he didn't really write his own uh, material. He didn't write his own screenplays. So he's not like, say, Woody Allen um, or I think Ingmar Bergman, where uh, he's also writing the script. He would principally adapt. Mm -hmm. Um, 
he was born in the West Bronx, uh, or actually, I don't know if he was born in the West Bronx, but he was he was brought up in the West Bronx, not too far from uh, where I used to live up in Washington Heights in Manhattan. You just cross the bridge and, and you're there um, into uh, an Austrian Jewish family. They were relatively well to do. His father was a doctor. Uh, and I recall reading about one of his schoolmates uh, who said that the Kubricks at one point actually had a house in the Bronx, hmm. which was pretty unusual. Uh, the schoolmate said it was the first house he remembers visiting of a friend. Hmm. So they weren't, they weren't hard up for money. Um, the, his Austrian Jewish identity uh, was, was very important to him. He wasn't, uh, a re- they weren't a religious uh, Jewish family and he professed uh, a- an atheistic view of life. So these were not, uh, you know, very religious people. One interesting fact about Kubrick, which carried through his life is that he never really lost that Bron- Bronx accent, even after he had lived in England hmm. for decades. Uh, there's a, a late interview with him. There's an inter- uh, an earlier interview with him, I think from 1966, you can find on YouTube where he clearly has this, the very thick accent. He's already famous. And the quality of that one is quite, uh, quite good. There's a later one, I think around the time that uh, Full Metal Jacket came out in the 80s. The quality is not that great, but he still has that Bronx <laughs> accent, which I think... <laughs> Uh, one, one thing I kind of want to do on this episode is sort of unpack his, his psychology as a, as an artist or his sort of artistic, how did he, how did he do it? How did he mm-hmm. accomplish these incredible, incredible uh, films? Because myself as an artist, I wonder how do you, how do you achieve that kind of greatness? So for me, this has been a bit of an exploration and kind of a reminder of, uh, how, um, monomaniacal you have to be and how mm. uh, extreme you need to be in order, in order to accomplish the, the things that he did. So yeah, and uh, film, yeah. Film directing is interesting in that regard because it's not, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a writer, you're a writer. Uh, I just sit down on the page and write stuff, yeah. which is a, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from it because I love it, but directing a film is bringing together all of these actual tangible elements in the real world like you got to like figure out how to actually make that thing happen it's very it, it's like yeah. running a business right right it's For, so that that in and mm-hmm. of itself is its own kind of art form absolutely and yeah. he as we'll see uh you know as we know was was a master of that uh and his personality is uh, a big part of that. So I think it's just interesting that he never really lost that, that accent. I think it says something about his reclusiveness, like you say, uh, and also possibly his stubbornness. Um, so he, he attended a public school number three in the Bronx, uh, moved to public school 90 in June of 38. So we're talking about the war. So he's a child, uh, you know, in elementary school during that period, they discovered, discovered that his IQ was above average but his, his attendance was poor. He missed 56 days in the first term alone. So he attended uh, school just as many days as he missed. Right. Uh, which <laughs> they didn't and, have anything to teach him, man. Nah, no, of course not. <laughs> and, you know, and he, uh, he would go and see double features. He was right. this almost a, a trope or a cliche. He would play hooky. He would go see double features. Yeah. Uh, he had an interest in literature from a, a young age and began reading Greek and Roman myths and the Grimm brothers. And he claimed this instilled in him a lifelong affinity with Europe. So Kubrick is this oh. interesting animal because he is a, he's a cosmopolitan uh, Jew who was raised in the Bronx and then ended up living most of his life in, in England. And we'll get to sort of his reasoning th- behind that. Yeah. I thought he was British. Yes, many people yeah. do. I yeah. mean, and it's fair to say that he, I don't think you would say that he was British. I don't know if he ever, if he ever achieved citizenship. He probably did. Uh, yeah. I would need to have, I would have to look at, look that up. But he, he was as much uh, a, a British person as an American by the end of his life, for sure. sure. And most of the, the later films were, were filmed in, uh, in England and, and in, mm. in Europe. Um, so uh, he spent most Saturdays during the summer watching the Yankees and mm. he would later photograph two boys watching a baseball game uh, for an assignment for look magazine, uh, which will come up here shortly when he, mm. after he graduates high school. So when Kubrick was 12, his father, Jack taught him chess 
Now, this is a really important thing for Kubrick. The game remained a lifelong interest of his, and it appears in many of his films. Uh, he would later become a member of the U.S. Chess Federation and claimed that it developed patience and discipline for him. Uh, and I think if you look at his films and you know how chess operates, you can sort of see the mind of a chess player uh, at work, I, I would say. Yeah, There's I a mm. yeah, I think that's true. There's a coolness and a precision to his work, which a lot of people actually find off-putting. Uh, but you can sort of see the gears turning. At the age of 13, so at 12, he picks up chess. At 13, his father buys him a, a Graflex camera. And so now he, now he has photography in his hands. And he is a photographer uh, and a chess player before anything else. Okay. Uh, and so he found these things, you know, he found photography to be an incredible thing. Um, he ended up going to, uh, high school, uh, in, at William Taft High in the West Bronx, but was not a great student. He graduated with a D average <laughs> 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 and a low attendance record. He would go and watch movies. Uh, he was, however, the official school photographer, but he had no hope of getting into college. Uh, in 1966, he described himself as a school misfit, and he claimed he didn't read a book for pleasure until he graduated high school. Wow. Uh, now, the GIs were all coming back from World War II, and with his, his average, they wouldn't even look at it. His father, I think, walked him into NYU and may have introduced him to a dean, but there was nothing they could do for him. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one of his friends, um, Gerald Freed, uh, who I think may have been a composer who worked with him. Let me just make sure. And, I, you know, and, and Brad, we're kind of talking about um, this period. We're really getting into an interesting period, uh, which, yeah. is, which is not too far away from Burroughs and mm -hmm. the Beats. And we're in New York City. And I want you to kind of place that in your mind because yeah, it's going to... I mean, he mm -hmm. was born... Kubrick was born in 38, right? So, yep, yep. I mean, it's 16 years after, he was born 16 years after Kerouac. So, mm -hmm. you know, he was alive, certainly. He was 20 when On the Road came out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so Freed was uh, a, colleague, a colleague of his, of his and a friend of his. And uh, he worked on five of, of Stanley's earliest uh, films. Oh, wow. He went to Juilliard. Okay. So this is what Freed had to say about... Uh, Kubrick, he said he was kind of an awkward kid, and the fact that he was bright and talented made it even worse. He just wanted to be a regular guy, as we all do, and he wasn't, and it was, ve <laughs> <laughs> and it was very painful for him. Man, oh, man. So yeah. when he found out that he was smart and so, yeah, that he was smart and successful and all that, then it went the other way. Everything had to be grand. So for him, mm. this is a kid with a chip on his shoulder. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think you can see that come across in his work, the way he treats the human subject. Uh, and of course, the scope and the, the um, just the ambition of his, his work. Yeah. I think you can, they're, you can they're see. They're totalizing. Those movies yes. are like totalizing. They're, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I don't even know if I know what that means, but it feels. <laughs> they're, they're, you, you, no other filmmaker is as successful, to my mind, at taking you into a completely different world. Yeah, you talk about world building now with like this sci-fi or fantasy movie or something, and and really Kubrick does it because mm. the world exists like down to the fibers in the carpet, basically. And, and we're going to talk about that because he would drive <laughs> his collaborators mad yeah. with detail. Yeah. Um, so I'm quoting here. Later in life, Kubrick spoke disdainfully of his education and of contemporary American schooling as a whole maintaining that schools were ineffective in stimulating critical thinking and student interest. So uh, there you have it. Yeah. Well now, so Stanley is arriving at the end of high school. Uh, he did have girlfriends in high school. And in fact, he, he married in 1948, his high school sweetheart, uh, wow. Toba Metz. Okay. Uh, they, I mean, this is, he was 19 years old. So yeah. of course we're dealing with a little bit of a different time here where you wouldn't cohabitate and and get freaky <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> without <laughs> getting married. married. So, yeah. Yeah. right. Um, uh, they lived at 36 West 16th Street near Greenwich Village. So now you got to imagine that he's, it's the late 40s. The war is over. There, he's in Greenwich, Greenwich Village. And 
this puts him at the epicenter of American cultural life at the time. Yeah. Um, this marriage was not to last long, but uh, I want to rewind real briefly and say he was very interested in photography. And this is probably the thing that that saved his life. I mean, in addition to his genius, because you've got this D student growing up in the Bronx, just missed the war, wasn't draft, of course, was too young to be drafted. Yeah. Uh, but he had his, his camera. And at around the age of 17, he managed to get a job as a staff photographer for Look Magazine. Now, Look, to my understanding, was kind of second to Life Magazine. It was yeah. a glossy magazine, a big deal. And he managed to talk his way into a gig uh, as, as a staff photographer. And they would send him on assignments. And if I'm not mistaken, they even sent him to Portugal at one point. Huh. So he, he must have, and this will come back in a bit, he, he must have had some charismatic genius. They, people, hmm. people who could recognize genius or, or talent, at least at this point, saw that he had something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he was already making good enough money to move out on his own by the time he was 18 or 19. I brought Woody Allen up once before. Uh, Woody Allen uh, was writing jokes and making more money than his parents by the time he was 20. <laughs> Uh, so we, this is a different, this is a different world too. I, somebody mm -hmm. posted something recently on Twitter about how back in the day, you know, we read about Hemingway and all these other writers and company, you know, flitting around the world. Well, a single short story from somebody with a name would pay $40,000 right. <laughs> back, back in the day. Now, right. uh, you're, you're lucky to, to have an email job that, yeah. that pays that much in a year. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. so we're, it's a different time. Uh, yeah. So he is, this is a, another fun fact, which I think is a good insight into, it offers a good insight into his um, keenness, the keenness of his psychology uh, or, or of his, his thinking about human psychology. He would supplement his income playing chess for quarters in Washington Square Park and at various clubs. He huh. would pay for dinner with his chess winnings. That's crazy. He would eat on it. And when you hear him talk in interviews, he would talk about potsers and how they would wait for a potser to show up and they would just, they'd beat him. They, you know, what's, the, the, what's a potser? A potser is just somebody who makes moves and doesn't really understand the strategy of the game. Ah, Not, a potser me. is a schlub. That's me. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's somebody that you can beat, and he would he would use. Uh, I mean, I want to I want to give the ex the exact. Uh, uh, so Potser is um, well, uh, da -da -da, it's a specific thing in chess. Um, it's a scrub. It's somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. A mark, an easy, in, somebody you could you could if you you know hustle a little bit. Right. He claimed he never hustled, but he yeah. he was definitely winning enough money to pay for dinner playing chess, yeah. Uh, yeah. which I think is I think is That's fantastic. Awesome. That's amazing. And, you know, what a what an education to be hanging out in Washington Square Park uh, at 17, 18 years old, playing chess, and all the all the strong players would avoid playing one another for money. Mm -hmm. And they would wait for somebody weaker to come along, take their money, and then they would play. And the stronger players would offer an advantage. They'd let you play white, or sometimes the really strong yeah. players would let you play white in a move. Right. Uh, I just think to be doing having, that yeah mm -hmm. you're having fun and it's a little bit of yeah it's just like a pool hall it's a pool mm -hmm. hall for mm -hmm. people with slightly higher iqs <laughs> <laughs> yeah that sounds about right yeah uh so he's getting it i think what i'm arguing there is that he's getting an education in humanity there for mm -hmm. sure um so let's talk a little bit about toba his first wife so this is gerald fried again um of toba saying i knew toba they were still in their teens. It almost didn't count. It was a legal ma marriage, but they were like dating. There was no exchange of any deep affection. Mm -hmm. uh, now, he would stay with Toba until 1951 uh, when he would meet his second wife not long after. Her name was Ruth Sabatka, and I believe she was a dancer, and she features, I think, in Killer's Kiss, uh, which is the the first feature well it's not technically the first feature but it's sort of the first commercial feature he made a uh, kind of a student film like an art arty student film with a bunch of people um out in california called uh fear and desire but i want to get to that in a little bit i'm trying to huh. i'm trying to go in order here um but he, you know so let's see here so gerald is talking about ruth 
So uh, with Ruth Sabatka, Kubrick's second wife, she was a match. She was a dancer, bright and good looking and accomplished. And there was a lot of sparring, but I thought they were quite perfect for each other. He wrote that dance sequence in Killer's Kiss, which I just watched. It's a noir film uh, about a boxer. And we'll, we'll get to that too, because it's about one of his first shorts is about a boxer as well. He was oh, very okay. interested in boxing. Of course, I think it's important to remember that like in the 40s and the 50s in, in New York, and, and elsewhere, boxing was huge yeah. all the way through the first half of the 20th century. Now, it's a, it seems to be a bit of a clown show. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, that second marriage also wasn't, wasn't built to last. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll arrive at his third wife, which is the, the one who, who made it all the way with him um, later. But I want to I wanna talk about um, his very, very early work. And there's a short film, if you haven't seen... Um, I recommend you do uh, called day of the fight. Hmm. And it was based on a photo series that he did for look magazine, where he interviewed a boxer um, and took pictures of the boxer all through the day of a big fight. Well, so he adapted this into a a documentary and it's about a 15 minute documentary. Uh, It's on YouTube and it, it's one of these things where you watch it and you go, oh, wow, clearly this is a, a young filmmaker, but mm-hmm. all of the stuff that is eventually right. going to become what you associate with, with Kubrick is there. The sense of drama. Uh, it uses voiceover, which is something that he would use a lot in his, in his early films. And it, even all the way through Barry Lyndon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Barry Lyndon has the, the voiceover uh, feature where it's narrated over the, um, over the, uh, the, the film itself. Um, so it's all there and it's really dramatic. And of course, Scorsese uh, talks about day of the fight as a, um, as a point of reference. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so he would, so he did this and then his, well, I want to, I don't want to go out, out of order, but we're going to come back to the boxing as a, um, um, a subject, a subject for him. And it's not something everybody knows about Kubrick because of course we all, his later work is just so bright and iconic that it swamps all this earlier material. Mm -hmm. Um, So he made this film called Fear and Desire. This was his first feature film, technically a feature. It's only about 60 minutes long. Uh, He got some money from his family to make this. And it's kind of this, I watched it. You can find it. He probably wouldn't be that happy that it's out there. <laughs> uh, if you have Amazon Prime, you can find it. I think watch it for free. It's one of these oddities that you would watch only because Kubrick made it. Right. Uh, it has the feeling of a, a student film, uh, but there's clearly some genius at work. It, it's kind of this wartime liminal place where there are these characters wandering through the woods uh, trying to get back across enemy lines, something to that effect, which of course is a subject that he would return to in um, Paths of Glory. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to read about this. Uh, Fear and Desire was a commercial failure, but it garnered several positive reviews. And that was really important at this point because he's trying to make his career. You need to have those reviews. So the critics Mm -hmm. from the New York Times believe that Kubrick's professionalism as a photographer shown through the picture picture and that he artistically Hmm. caught glimpses of the grotesque attitudes of death, the wolfishness of hungry men, as well as their bestiality. And in one scene, the racking effect of lust on a pitifully juvenile soldier and the pinioned girl he is guarding. So there's a, there's a girl chained to a tree at one point. Columbia university scholar, Mark Van Doren was highly impressed by the scenes with the girl bound to the tree, remarking that it would live on as a beautiful, terrifying and weird sequence, which illustrated Kubrick's immense talent and guaranteed his future success. Kubrick later expressed embarrassment with fear and desire and attempted over the years to keep prints of the film out of circulation. Yeah. Now, well. now, I read this, and of course, this is, this is Art of Darkness, so we're trying to get into the darker side of, of, mm-hmm. of Stanley. Yeah. Uh, so I read, during the production of the film, Kubrick almost killed his cast with poisonous gases by mistake. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> I mean, and this is this is him and his friends. These are right. amateur. Yeah, they were hanging out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were hanging out in California making a movie yeah. uh, in the early 50s. And apparently he nearly poisoned them. Mm. <laughs> so, whoopsie daisy. Yeah. Well, so now uh, we're in 53. 
Uh, and so he's already divorced. No, wait, hold on. Do you think, sorry, the poisonous gas thing. Do you <laughs> think that was such a commitment to veracity that he decided he had to use actual poisonous gas instead of just like a fog machine? Or Yeah, mm. <laughs> you, you know, here's the thing. I, I read, now take this, take this with a grain of salt. Uh, yeah. I didn't pick this up in the biography. I did find this on Wikipedia. There's a reference and the reference uh, is to a broken link, uh, but it is from Time Magazine in 56, the new picture. Okay. So I think okay. there must be something to it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> no, I believe it. I believe yeah. it. You know, and it must have had something to do with, uh, well, who knows? Um, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think he was trying okay. to, to okay. intentionally. Fair this enough. isn't like what he would do to Shelley Le- uh, Duvall later, which we'll yeah. get to. Yeah, the oh, famous, I do want to get there. Yeah, the famous treatment of Shelley Duvall. Mm. Um, on The Shining. So, all right. So we're still in the early 50s. He's got one feature film that's had a very limited release, commercial failure. He hasn't made his money back, but it was a critical success that put him on the radar. Uh, so now he's he's divorced and he's met his second second wife, Ruth, uh, and they're married in 52. Or he, they weren't married in 52, but they were living together in 52. They would marry in 55, uh, moved to Hollywood in 55, hmm. and now we're into Killer's Kiss, which is a noir film uh, that I just watched, uh, which also tackles the subject of a boxer uh, who's dealing with crime um, and all the rest. So I'll read about Killer's Kiss. It's worth watching. It has a lot of wonderful photography. There's a sequence uh, where the boxer, the protagonist, is... Um, dreaming. And there is a, an effect where he inverted the film. I don't know what you would call it, where he, where the colors are inverted. Okay. It's, bla- it's yeah. black and white. So, yeah. and it's a view of New York city zooming forward. And it looks a lot like the, the final sequences in 2001, a space odyssey, oh, but wow. black and white. And it's yeah. only a brief bit. It's maybe three seconds of it. Yeah. But you go, ah, interesting. Then the, yeah. the, huh. the pinnacle of the film has a, uh, has a man chasing the, the hero with an ax. So we're back to huh. uh, the shining. And there are all these, yeah. these little moments in it where you go, oh, that's interesting. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So mm-hmm. huh. this is worth watching. So, uh, the film is about Davy Gordon, a 29-year-old welterweight New York boxer at the end of his career and his relationship with his neighbor, tack, uh, a dancer named Gloria Price, and her violent employer, Vincent Rapallo. So it's, it's a noir film. And mm-hmm. you watch it, and you can tell you're watching an above, uh, clearly above-average filmmaking. There are, I'll, uh, I'll definitely check that out, because I, I actually kind of love noir, but like 75% of them are terrible. <laughs> 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 yeah when it's it's only si- uh 67 minutes uh long okay uh you know it was let me see here it was privately funded uh forty thousand dollars came from a bronx pharmacist named morris Busey, something to that effect <laughs> uh why not he yeah. he began shooting footage in times square there's a sequence at the end in um uh grand central station which is lovely um, he was experimenting at, the, cool. at that point. Um, and now uh, Scorsese cited Kubrick's innovative shooting angles and atmospheric shots in Killer's Kiss as an influence on Raging Bull. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. Irene Kane, the star of that film, observed that Stanley's a fascinating character. He thinks movies should move with a minimum of dialogue, and he's all for sex and sadism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so critics praise the camera work but it's acting and story are generally considered mediocre but it's worth watching uh and uh quite a lot of quite a lot of fun so we're getting into the big time now and this is another moment like the look magazine moment which to me is very telling so he's 17 years old and he, he gets a staff job on, on a major magazine as a photographer. How? Yeah. We, we'll never know. <laughs> he's, yeah. He has some sort of hypnotic uh, passion for what he, what he has to do. Probably because he has nowhere else to go. None of the colleges are going to have a look at him. Uh, so while playing mm-hmm. chess in Washington Square, so he's playing chess in Washington Square Park, 
Kubrick meets producer James Harris, who considered Kubrick the most intelligent, most creative person I have ever come in contact with. Wow. So they form a corporation in 55. Uh, Harris purchased the rights to a novel by Lionel White called Clean Break for $10,000, which is no, that's no small chunk of change now. Then that's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kubrick wrote the script. Then Kubrick suggested they hire a novelist to write the dialogue. So they hired Jim Thompson. And then this film became The Killing. Have you seen The Killing, Brad? I saw it years ago. I couldn't tell you much about it. Right. Well, The Killing uh, is a film about a racetrack robbery that goes wrong. Mm. Uh, and it stars Sterling Hayden, who would come back as Jack T. Ripper in... Uh, in strange love. So okay. he's the, uh, the protagonist and it's a heist movie. Um, they moved to LA to, to work on it. And it's a really good film. Mm -hmm. Uh, it did not get a proper release. Didn't make a lot of money. It was only promoted as a second feature to a Western back when they packaged movies. Yeah. Uh, but critics lauded it and a reviewer in time, compared it to the camera work to Orson Welles, which is very high. Yeah. Uh, and it's held up very, very well. So the critics consider it to be among his best early films, uh, and it would influence a lot of people. Uh, mm -hmm. Quentin Tarantino claims that it influenced Reservoir Dogs. No, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, wow. and you can see that. So there's a, there's a scene where they are planning the heist, and they're all sitting around the, the table talking about what, you know, what the plan's going to be. Yeah. So this is a great example of a young artist uh, already, already twice married, completely passionate about his work, willing to do almost anything, willing to poison his cast <laughs> for, for his work, <laughs> willing to travel to, to LA, whatever it takes, we're going to do it. I'm going to get $40,000 from a pharmacist to make this movie. We're going to yeah. do it. Um, this, this film, uh, The Killing, caught the attention of Door Sherry at MGM, and they offered him $75,000 to write, direct, and produce a film. And that film was to become Paths of Glory. Wow. Uh, okay. Have you seen Paths of Glory? I have seen Paths of Glory. I think that, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. We talked about it a little bit offline. Yeah, that's a great film. And that was, yeah, you can see that. You could see there's a master at work. You got a master's hand at, t at the till, basically, in that film. For sure. Without a doubt. Uh, here's a quote from Colleen Gray before we we move on from the killing. She was the co-star of the killing about Stanley. He was a, he was this small man wearing army fatigues and clodhopper shoes and had bushy hair and was very quiet. I kept waiting for him to direct and nothing happened. When, when's he going to tell me what to do? He never did, which made me feel insecure. He seemed extremely preoccupied. Maybe the fact that I felt insecure was fine for the part. The girl was insecure. So now we're getting into this uh, thing that I think would carry through his career. He would manipulate the hell out of his actors. <laughs> right. He right. would work them. And I think Could we're... you imagine just like, do, because you want this woman to have an emotional complex going on, you're just going to... You're going to give her, her one. Yeah. Exactly. And I think this is, this is wow. the young man playing chess in Washington Square for quarters for dinner, now mm. doing it with mm. actors and with, right. other, with other talent. Right. And right. there's a lot to be said about this. Um, and of course, the results are pretty, are pretty clear. He got what he needed mm. uh, for, for the art, and he drew out innumerable great performances. Mm. Uh, so I think this is a, a, a fun insight into his character, even at that, even at that young age. So now we're getting into Paths of Glory, which is this extraordinary film. Uh, if you've not seen it, I, I recommend it. Um, Kirk Douglas uh, stars as a colonel in World War I the, uh, of the French. So I don't want to go into the whole plot of it, but I'm going to read some things about Paths of Glory. Uh, when it came out, Bosley Crother of the New York Times wrote, the close hard eye of Mr. Kubrick's sullen camera bores directly into the minds of scheming men and into the hearts of patient, frightened soldiers who have to accept orders to die. 
Uh, hmm. Despite the praise, the Christmas release date was criticized. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not the most imp- appropriate film for for Christmas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man, Hollywood, what are you going to do? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so interesting. I, I got to make sure I get back to Paths of Glory here. Yeah, such a wonderful film. Yeah. yeah. The subject was controversial in Europe. And this was, this was not the first time that he would have a film that was banned. Uh, the film oh, was banned really? in France until 1974 uh, for its unflattering unflatter- depiction of the French military. And it was censored oh, by wow. the Swiss Army until 1970. Yeah, well, <laughs> get over it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a masterpiece. The the yeah. composition, the use of yeah. light, the contrast of the generals and the and the troops themselves, the, yeah. the passage where they're crawling through no man's land, all of it uh, yeah. tremendous. And Kirk Douglas is wonderful in it. Oh, he's, he's fantastic in it. Swinging I, cats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember there's a scene in it well because a lot of it is a fair amount of it takes place in trench right like so uh i I just remember there's a scene where they go basically into sort of an officer's uh office bunker bunker, Bunker. you know in the down in the trench and i i just loved this transition that it makes and this the set design of the of that bunker versus the trench itself yeah and you could see the the absolutely obsessive perfectionist attention to detail in all of those things. Yeah. Without like he never did. Kubik never did anything on accident. It didn't seem like. No, there wasn't anything that was done by accident. And in fact, when we get to 2001, I'll tell you kind of an, an insider story about an example. Oh, okay. Of that. Yeah. Um, so based on paths of glory, now we're in the big time. Marlon Brando, contacted Kubrick and asked him to direct a film adaptation of a Western called The Authentic Death of Henry Jones, uh, which featured Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Brando said that Stanley is unusually perceptive and delicately attuned to people. He has an an adroit intellect and is a creative thinker, not a repeater, not a fact gatherer. He digests what he learns and brings to a new project an original point of view and a reserved passion. They worked on a script for six months uh, which had been uh, begun by Sam wow. Peckinpah, who was uh, unknown at the time. But they didn't get along. And uh, they uh, had disputes. And in the end, Kubrick uh, left. And that film would go on to become One-Eyed Jacks. Okay. Uh, but he, now we're in the big time. We're, yeah. we're fighting with Marlon Brando now. Right. <laughs> right. So we're a long yeah. way from D grades at William Taft right. High School in the Bronx. Borrowing um, 40 grand from pharmacists. Right. So we're in the big leagues now, and the next movie, the next film is, is the um, prime example of that. And so it's February of 1959, and he gets the phone call from Kirk Douglas, who he directed in um, Paths of Glory, uh, asking him to direct Spartacus. Uh, now, Douglas had acquired the rights to the novel. Uh, Dalton Trumbo had begun penning the script. Trumbo was blacklisted. Uh, the script was, it was, the film was produced by Douglas, who starred. And of course, you have Laurence Olivier and uh, uh, pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. So Douglas hired Kubrick for $150,000. So pretty sweet. Doubled, uh, doubled his rate. We're in, we're in the big time here. Uh, yeah. To take over direction after he fired Anthony Mann. So that's a bummer. You're, uh, you're the first drummer for the Beatles there. That's yeah. not fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, You've seen uh, Spartacus. I have, yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonderful film. You don't get Gladiator without Spartacus. There's so many right. f- films you, you just don't get without this movie. It's really worth a rewatch. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you saw it when you were younger, you might have thought, oh, this is quite long. It's really not. Uh, it's mm-hmm. epic. It's moving. Uh, when, when they stand up and, and say, I am Spartacus or I'm Spartacus, it's a really perfect cinematic moment. It's it very is, moving. Yeah. 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 Um, he was 31 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> it was, and he's now directing a cast of over 10,000 people with a $6 million budget. It was the, at the time it was the most expensive film ever made in America. Oh really? And he was oh. the youngest director in Hollywood history to make an epic. That's, uh, Oh, you've got a, 
you got to have some cojones to do that. You have got to be so confident. You have had to hustle so many potsers in Washington Square to get that call. But this is the big leagues. This is, hey, you're you're batting first for the Yankees. Right. You're 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 pitching on the big day. You're pitching. Well, and you you mean he killed it in Paths of Glory, right? He killed it so hard in Paths of Glory Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. this legendary Mm -hmm. Hollywood actor was like, "That's my guy," and I'll bring him in. He's a kid, you know. And, uh, but we believe in him. Right. Yeah. Dang. Incredible. Well, so now he's, uh, this is the first time he used something called the anamorphic 35 millimeter uh, horizontal super technorama process. I don't know uh, what well, any yes, of that of course, means. The, yeah. Uh, the but super he, technorama. Yeah, the super he technorama. Like Film nerds will know what this is. <laughs> but he achieved ultra high definition and he was able to capture large panoramic scenes, including one with 8,000 trained soldiers from Spain representing the Roman army. 8,000 Spanish soldiers yeah. as extras. Yeah, see, now you just CGI those guys in, right? Right, and it, but yeah. it's not the same, is it? No. Well, not so now, know. and this would be the last film that he did not have complete creative control over. Mm -hmm. So, because he was a hired hand on this, uh, disputes broke out. Kubrick complained about not having full creative control. Uh, He wanted to improvise. Well, Mm -hmm. could you imagine? So the the thing we talked about, the confidence to take that job as a 31-year-old person with only a couple items on your resume, and then to also be like, hey, I should have more control (laughs) around here, if if you ask me. Yes, (laughs) right. Yeah, absolutely. The Stones. <laughs> yeah, they were That's at awesome. odds. They were at odds over the script, and Kubrick angered Kirk Douglas when he cut all but two of Douglas's lines from the opening thirty minutes. He was Stanley Kubrick was very <laughs> anti dialogue. He wanted yeah. as little language as possible on the yeah. screen. He wanted the screen to tell the story. He wanted yeah. the visuals to tell as much of the story as possible. So they had onset troubles, but they got it done, and it made uh, $14.6 million uh, at the box office in its first run, and that was off a budget of $6 million. So they more than doubled their money, yeah. and it was nominated for four Academy Awards. Uh, oh, no, it, it won four. I take it back. It, it uh, hey. had six nominations, won four, uh, and it convinced him that if – so much could be made of such a problematic production, he could achieve anything. Ah, yes. It did mark the end of the relationship with Kubrick and Douglas, though. Ah. <laughs> Douglas is on his way out. Yeah. Yeah. Guess, eventually. Uh, <laughs> they made a couple of good movies. <laughs> they did. Yeah. 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 Well, that movie's a- still talked about and thought about. And, you know, it's interesting. Is I don't think people think about it in the Kubrick um I don't think of that as a Kubrick film, even though I know he directed it. Right. Yeah. Right. It's there and it's worth watching, but it's not a mm-hmm. Kubrick film the way that A Clockwork Orange is right. uh, Is a Kubrick film. Yeah. Uh, so I want to, we're going uh, around a little bit here now. I, I'm going to read some things because I, I want to keep the timeline kind of roughly coherent. So we're going to go back to Paths of Glory right now because that's where he met his third wife, his wow. final wife. So, I'm going to read this. During the production of Paths of Glory in Munich in 1957, Kubrick met and romanced the German actress Christiane Harlan, who played a small though memorable role in the film. So if you recall Paths of Glory, at the very end, they've captured a German Fräulein, and Mm -hmm. she's a singer, and she Mm -hmm. sings to the French soldiers in German, and the French soldiers begin to hum along with her tune. It's very moving. Mm -hmm. That, That was his wife. That oh, woman okay. becomes, becomes his third wife. Okay. So he married her in 58. He's a fast mover. He, he's yeah. meeting these women and then marrying these women. It's, yeah. He's yeah. doing, he's, uh, he's making honest uh, women of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, uh, we had a yeah. joke about, uh, we, I have an uncle who was married uh, six or seven times. Um, <laughs> he would marry very fast. And we had a joke that he didn't believe in premarital sex. Right, right. <laughs> he wanted to sleep around a lot, but he, he also just, had problems. Right, he had, he had standards. Yeah. yeah, right, right. <laughs> God is watching. Uh, so he married her in 58, and, in, and they would have two daughters together uh, in 59 and 60. And, and no kids with the previous wives. Uh, they had a stepdaughter, but no, okay. no children with the previous uh, women. Okay. Um, she was also going through a divorce. I see. Um, 
So this is another thing about Stanley Kubrick and his family. And if you watch the uh, the documentary about him, and it's also said by a number of people, he was a family man. He okay. was he was very much about his family, and he worked with his family. His family mm-hmm. would work on his films. It was like as really grips and stuff. Or... Uh, yeah, in different aspects, in editing, yeah. in different different elements. Okay. Uh, you know, I like to. He's he was certainly a patriarch. And mm. I like to think of him as a kind of like a mob boss, but for film. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty cool. I'm going to get it done. I'm getting the yeah. film done. We're all going to work together. It's going to be a labor of love. It's going to be a labor of passion. Um, mm. And we'll get into the the period in England here shortly. But um, they settled into a home in Beverly Hills. She already had a daughter. So this mm. is in 59. Um, they would move in. And this is getting to what what's up next. They moved to the United Kingdom in 61 to make Lolita. And this is when he, he started working with uh, Peter Sellers in anticipation of Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Sellers was un- unable to leave the UK, so Kubrick made Britain his permanent home. Uh, the move was quite convenient to Kubrick since he shunned the Hollywood system and its publicity machine. Uh, and he and Christian had become alarmed with the increase in violence in New York City. So he... Uh. He found England to be more palatable. He also said um, about LA, he found it, he could not live in LA because everyone there seemed disappointed when he would announce his success. So people in LA, according to Kubrick, would come up to him and say, how are things going? And he would say, fantastic, I just got hired to work on the new Kirk Douglas movie. And they would look disappointed Mm. uh, because of that backbiting, backstabbing, phony LA culture, uh, which I think is even, still even even existed in the 50s, I guess, huh? 50s and the 60s. Yes. Yeah. So he could not live there in LA. He did not like it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So he found uh, he found England to be a lot more palatable. Uh, so uh, reading a quote from Richard Anderson, uh, let's see, he's an actor producer, and he was a dialogue coach, um, and an actor on Paths of Glory. Uh, He said, one time when Kirk Douglas blew up at him on the set, Stanley said, geez, Kirk, you don't have to do this in front of everybody, do you? But he admired Kirk. He said, my God, this guy always knows his lines. (laughs) Stanley is very psychological to get what he wants. One time he had done about 40 takes and Jimmy Harris comes and says, Stanley, it's now one o'clock and we're in terrible trouble and we got to break this up. That was the only time I saw Stanley go nuts. He shouted, it isn't right and I'm going to keep doing it until it is right. He shot 84 takes. I think he (laughs) wanted everybody to hear that. He wanted it to get around. Yeah. This is one of the things that he had a reputation for was lots and lots and lots of takes. His theory about filmmaking is that the film itself was the, was the cheapest part of production. Okay. His attitude was we're here. Everyone's here. Let's get it down. I want 10 different versions of this line. And he would, he would piece it all together in the editing room. Right. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he would, he would say his, the editing room for him was, was his happy place. Okay. Because that was where the movie finally would be made. Right. right. Well, um, yeah, if you're doing 80 takes, well, obviously he wasn't doing 80 takes of everything. But yeah, that would be, right? You're picking and choosing and watching things over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so... We're still on paths of glory here, and I know we're jumping around a little bit, but it's roughly the same period. And then we'll move into the English period with Lolita. But Gerald Freed, the composer, said, by the time we got to paths of glory, he was already Stanley Kubrick with quotes, right? He was already Mm -hmm. a genius. And then it was a struggle. I had to rationalize every note. It was fun and stimulating, but he was already sure that he knew it all. He was also a drummer, and the score for Paz of Glory was the first all percussion score. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I didn't. I have to watch it again. Um, yeah, I never yeah. caught that. As I remember, he also heard every single machine gun sound effect before it went into the picture. So we're talking that level of detail. Yeah, I want to yeah. hear the machine gun sound effect. Um, this is not a guy who's handing it over to a sound designer to say, no. "Hey, you know." And he, Gerald would say, we had a date once to play tennis in Central Park, and it was around 10 to 2, and our court was reserved for 2. And he said, hey, we better run, because if you're not there one minute before, they could give the court away. This is still true. If you want to play tennis yeah. in Central Park, it's like this. It's like a scrum. Yeah. 
I said, Stanley, for God's sake, keep your paranoia to yourself, man. And of course, somebody showed up one minute before and took the court from us. (laughs) So if you worry about enough things, sooner or later, your paranoia is going to be fulfilled. Right. And he worried about enough things. It was as if his success gave him permission to let his fears predominate. Mm. So this may Mm. contribute to some of his reputation. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, as a control freak. Um, you know, getting forward to, um, to Spartacus, I have a couple of quotes from, um, from Tony Curtis and one from Christian uh, Kubrick, um, his wife. So the first one from Tony Curtis, Stanley would never capitulate. I remember he asked for 15 or 20 extras for a little scene and the assistant, assistant director came over and said they had talked it over with the studio and decided to cut down the amount of extras. And Stanley said, no, we'll double the amount. He refused to allow anybody to tell him how to do the picture. 31 years old. Yeah. <laughs> I need more extras. Incredible. And then uh, Christian Kubrick, who's a, who's a painter in her own right. And uh, okay. she's lovely in the uh, documentary. It's worth watching. And she clearly was very much the right one for him. Uh, Spartacus was difficult. They were all famous actors in it. And they treated him because he was so young with a certain arrogance. So mm. he was arrogant right back. Yeah. He loved Tony Curtis because they had lots in common. They both like magic tricks. <laughs> <laughs> So this, I like that though. I like yeah. this idea that you're a kid from the Bronx. You're 31 years old. You know how to yeah. hustle chess. Uh, yeah. You're clearly a genius. You've proven yourself. You've already made paths of glory. And yeah. you and Tony Curtis get along because you both like uh, yeah. magic, magic tricks, tricks. card <laughs> tricks and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain kind of um, uh, just like a classist kind of fun kind of thing mm-hmm. about that. I don't know. I mm-hmm. love that. No, I like yeah. that. It's yeah. Good detail. Well, so... Now we're getting into the English period. And uh, what do you know about Lolita, Brad, the film? You know, I, I don't think I've ever seen Lolita, the film. Really? I mean, I've read the book. Yeah, but I've never, I don't think I've ever actually seen it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's yeah. a, a black comedy. And mm-hmm. it was shot over 88 days on a budget of $2 million in the mm-hmm. UK. Uh, he clashed with Shelley Winters, the actress. He found her very difficult and demanding, nearly fired her at one point. Uh, it stars Peter Sellers. So we're beginning that collaboration. James mm-hmm. Mason, Shelley Winters, and Sue Leon, uh, who played the so role Shelley of Shelley Winters course. played Lolita. I'm assuming. No, Shelley Winters plays the mother. Oh, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, this is, this is problematic. To, to say the least, to make the film Lolita. The way, I, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, the way they pitched this film uh, was how did they ever make a, make a movie out of Lolita? Mm-hmm. That was the, used on the posters. You know, going back to Killer's Kiss uh, way early, this is, this is the, uh, what's on the poster. It says, her soft mouth was the road to sin-smeared violence. <laughs> I love that's, stuff like that. That's not even innuendo. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Like... <laughs> it, you know, and it's a guy with an ax up front and yeah, it, it looks like a Mondrian, but with the right. kind of trashy, fantastic. Yeah. I love this stuff. Yeah. Well, and we're not that far removed. Uh, now we're moving into a higher kind of literature with Lolita, yeah. but it's still yeah. right on the edge of what's uh, oh, I mean, Lolita is still controversial a little bit. For yeah. sure. Yeah. 1962. Uh, yeah. he's making this and hmm. he did get complete control of the film, but we're dealing with, uh, subject matter that's extremely provocative. So it really generated a lot of controversy, uh, controversy. He was forced to comply with censors and he had to remove a lot of the, the erotic element of the relationship between Humbert Humbert and Lolita. Yeah, because even if the actress is like of age, but she's supposed to be portraying a character who is, I think she's 14 in Lolita Mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, you can't really make it like sexy. I mean, I don't know. I guess you can do whatever you want, but it's weird if you make it actually sexy. Yeah, it, it's it's worth watching because of how it skirts around all of it. And it's okay. frankly reminiscent of a lot of the films from the code period or pre-code, whatever whatever it's called, where yeah. 
homosexual themes, there were there was always new innuendo. And it's mm-hmm. all, like if you watch Rope, it's hinted at, and it's mm-hmm. it's a bit of a wink of it and a nudge, and it kind of works in a funny way, and it's it's similar in in Lolita. Uh, the pacing is also really extraordinary. the The mm-hmm. road trip with Lolita doesn't even really begin until midway through the film. It's very it's a very mm-hmm. interesting film. It's interesting to watch. It's not my favorite Kubrick, uh, but it's worthy of mm-hmm. of a look. Um, and it's held up really well in terms of the critics. Um, uh, John Fortgong of Film 4 wrote that Lolita, with its acute mix of pathos and comedy and Mason's mellifluous delivery of Nabokov's sparkling lines, remains the definitive depiction of tragic transgression. Hmm. So, you know, someone else wrote, uh, Stephen Kersher wrote that it demonstrated uh, its director possessed a keen satiric insight into the social landscape and sexual hangups of Cold War America. So I think it's this funny thing where he's now living in England and now he's looking back to America with the eye of an expat. Mm-hmm. And I think that's to come back with the next film. Um, I'm going to turn on my light here. Hang on. All right. <clears throat> Just have to, uh, I'm going to be reading from the book here shortly. We're, we're coming back, coming up to the next film, which is maybe where, short of Spartacus, most people start to pick up the, the Kubrick oeuvre, mm-hmm. uh, oeuvre uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Strangelove, yeah. or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before we do, I want to read a couple of quotes from the Lolita set. So Shelley Winters uh stated that on Lolita, he was very cognizant that actors are delicate. He would discuss the scene with you and you never thought you were being directed until you saw the rushes the next day. You almost said, gee, wasn't I clever to think of that? But it was Stanley who had sort of planted it very subtly in your head. (laughs) Like the dance I did with James Mason, a sexy sort of South American dance. He didn't really tell me to make a sexy dance. I decided to flirt with him while I was dancing in a sexy way. And he said, that's it. He was very elusive. Sometimes you might rehearse and you didn't even know he was watching. He'd be off somewhere, sort of hidden watching. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. It's yeah, like yeah. This, this guy on the set and he's got right. these dark eyes and he's got right. this mop of hair and he dresses right. kind of schlubby. Yeah. One of the things that someone, one of the ad- anecdotes that I picked up on earlier, um, about his earlier life was that in a lot of these early meetings in New York, he would dress in kind of a, a beat fashion, right? He would mm. dress with sort of loose clothes. He wouldn't wear a tie. He wasn't dressed super smartly. Mm. Uh, he looked a little schlubby uh, as mm. one of the people described earlier. And apparently this bothered some of the people in meetings, but the person uh, stated that in a few years they were all dressing that way. Oh, really? Yeah. So he was yeah. a little ahead of things um, yeah. in yeah. that regard. Um, Christian, uh, his wife, said he liked working with women and worked with them very successfully. He was surrounded by women at home, nothing but daughters, <laughs> and he employed quite a lot of women. He had an absolute angel of a mother, extraordinarily nice woman, very smart and very sweet. Stanley loved his parents. He was close to them, his mother more perhaps than his father because she was more up on films and the latest news. So in the end, he knew a great deal about women in general, ranging from the sophisticated to girl talk. Hmm. So I think there's an interesting thing about Kubrick. You might think of him as a very masculine director. I don't know. What do you think, Brad? Yeah, I would I would say off the bat, it seems like, you know, I mean, Full Metal Jacket and The Shining sure. and, you know, they're, yeah, they're not, they're, the films are not soft in general. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you wouldn't really um, think that. Yeah. You don't really think of him as someone, but you know, maybe when you, when you look at the movies, mm-hmm. I think he depicts women uh, in a, in a sympathetic way and in a smart way. I don't yeah, know. I don't think he's ever, a, oh, ever particularly objectifying mm. even in eyes wide shut. I think eyes wide shut. Well, we'll get there, but even in eyes wide shut, I don't think he's doing that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting quote I just saw here. Uh, So here we are. So let's talk about his settling in the UK. And I'm looking at Wikipedia now. So he moved to Lolita or he moved to the UK because uh, of the financing. 85% of the film was shot in the UK. And then he didn't have to worry about censorship and interference from the studios. And he set up his life so that family and business were combined. Uh, Christian told the London Times how rough New York had become. Because we're talking about like 
the late sixties, we're getting into taxi driver time. Right. And children having to be escorted to school by police. People are rude, smashed glass. Hopefully we're not going back that direction. It feels like we might be. Um, So he did thrive on that energy, but he really came to love the more genteel atmosphere of Britain. So he hires Peter Sellers. Sellers is unable to leave the UK. Uh, Apparently he never really considered himself an expatriate, but he, he did shun the Hollywood system and the machine there wasn't a lot of media coverage of him as a personality, which we discussed. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were living in 1965. They moved to a place called Abbott's Mead, uh, mm-hmm. just south of the Ells Tree Borumwood studio complex, which makes sense. Yeah. Uh, they're living in a turn of the 19th century house. Hmm. Uh, he worked exclusively from this home for 14 years, almost exclusively with wow. some exceptions. Uh, He researched, invented special effects techniques, designed ultra low light lenses for specially modified cameras, pre-produced, edited, post-produced, advertised, distributed, and carefully managed all aspects of four of his films from this house. 2001. Everything everything but shooting it. Everything but shooting it. 2001, A Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon and The Shining. Wow. Which is wild uh, to think about that. This is a guy who worked from home. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you gosh, know. Uh, I mean, we already talked about this, but four, you can't come up with four more different films than those. If any, if you're a filmmaker and you make two of those, yeah. you're on the list of legends. Yeah. Uh, these are four incredible films and we'll, we'll get to these here shortly. Uh, but first we have to talk about uh, Dr. Strangelove yeah. and yeah. Peter Sellers who played three three parts in the, uh, in the film, just an incredible movie. Uh, this is interesting. Kubrick's friend, Michael Hare pointed out that he did not live in Britain because he disliked America <clears throat> quoting God knows America was all he ever talked about. It was always on his mind and in his blood. And I think mm-hmm. that we have a person now living in England, it's 1963, 64, and he's making Dr. Strangelove, which is this, mm-hmm perhaps perhaps the definitive cold war movie uh, in hindsight what do you what do you think one of the yeah uh, i mean it's certainly it, it it dealt with all of the complexities of it in a way that any you know most movies that deal, dealt with the cold war at all were sort of like war movies mm-hmm. had a sort of an action aspect or like a spy thriller this was one of the few films that kind of took it on it's part parody you know it's maybe it's all parody in a way but um i know we um my first exposure to stanley kubrick was watching um dr strange love in high school actually like our teacher showed it to us and everybody i think a lot of people were kind of confused by it but i was like wait who made like I might, you know honestly that might have been the first time i was conscious of like a director as an artist you know what I mean? Like, rather than just, oh, that was a cool movie. Like, mm-hmm. wait, who made this? And like, what else did they make? And, you know, start to understand the process of somewhat of actually bringing a movie to, to, to screen. But I think you're right. I think because, yeah, it's certainly a, a Cold War movie. It deals with that paranoia, that bureaucratic paranoia better than just about anything. And the audacity to make it a comedy. Right. It's incredible. Gentlemen, you can't fight in yeah. here. This is the yeah. war room. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's brilliant. Incredible. Yeah. And the title it. itself mm-hmm. is hilarious. Yeah. How yeah. I how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Yeah. 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 He he had considered moving to Australia because he was afraid that New York City might be a target for the Russians. Uh, oh, really? apparently he studied over 40 military and political research books on the subject. And his conclusion about the cold war and potential nuclear war was that nobody really knew anything. And the whole situation was absurd. <laughs> yeah. That's usually my conclusion about most mm-hmm. stuff, most, most political phenomena. that are occurring. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so he makes this film and all through his life, he would divide the critics Uh, The New York Times film critic Bosley Crother worried that it was a discredit and even contempt for our whole defense establishment, the most shattering sick joke I've ever come across. Oh, 
<laughs> and somebody, uh, Robert Brustein of uh, Out of This World called it a juvenalian satire, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, uh, Kubrick yeah. responded to the criticism saying, a satirist is someone who has a very skeptical view of human nature, but who still has the optimism to make some sort of joke out of it, however brutal that joke might be. Mm. And of course, it's considered to be one of the greatest comedies of all time. Yeah, uh, totally. The Guardian named it the sixth best comedy of all time. It's essential viewing. Uh, yeah. There's there's no doubt that it's a, that it's a great film. So uh, kids, just remember sometimes the critics get it wildly wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, and especially if they're ever getting up in arms, like, oh, this is offensive to some the defense girl. establishment. Like, yeah, like, who cares about the defense establishment? <laughs> yeah, what a thing like, to write. <laughs> well, but this is the New York Times. It's always been right, that way, man. Right. I mean, they always carry water for the uh, right. for yeah. the elites, don't they? Yeah. Um, one way or another, whether they even know they're yeah. doing it or not. Yeah. Um, so... Ken Adam, who was a production designer, he designed Strange Love and Barry Lyndon, uh, said, I don't think I ever had such a close relationship with a director. There was a certain naivete and charm about him, but you very quickly found out that there was an enormous brain functioning. Mm -hmm. I think the most difficult part was his questioning, almost computer-like mind. He knew most of the technicians' work better than the technicians themselves. Hmm. The only thing he really didn't know was design. So obviously he was fascinated by it, but I also found myself having to justify practically every line I drew, which wasn't, wasn't always easy. He very often changed his mind. After two days of shooting, for example, he wasn't happy with Peter Sellers playing the B-52 bomber captain. So Sellers was already playing three other roles. They had him in the role of the bomber captain. So he cast Slim Pickens instead and then decided to have him ride the atomic bomb Bronco fashion into the Russian missile complex, which is one of my favorite moments in cinema. Oh, it's cinema. great. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. absurd. It was a very exciting experience, but at the same time, I felt, you know, one film would be enough. Being exposed to Stanley 16 hours a day, you lost your resistance, and the danger was you would lose your confidence. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're dealing with yeah. somebody who has this uh, intensity to the point where he, other people get lost in him. And right. there's a good film uh, called Film Worker, which deals with one of his major assistants who started as an actor. Uh, it's about English actor Leon Vitali, and he was on Barry Lyndon and would become his assistant for 30 hmm. years to Stanley Kubrick. Wow. It's a really wonderful movie. I recommend Film Worker because it does the job of reminding you that this whole myth about Kubrick and the one great genius just hides the fact that you're talking about a company. It's similar to the way that we think about maybe Steve Jobs. A yeah. lot of other people uh, oh, yeah. are involved in all of these films. Uh, mm -hmm. So we we do have this sort of great man problem when, when we're dealing with someone like Kubrick. Like, sure, of course, none of the films would exist if it weren't for Kubrick, but they also wouldn't exist if it weren't for the other people backing him up. So sure, it's worth pausing to remember that. Uh, and that that film is quite good. This They're dealing with, uh, you know, they, they have to deal with updating his films to, to every new format. They watch mm -hmm. every single frame to make sure that his vision is um, protected and coherent. Wow. Uh, he and rightly so. Yeah. Um, so still on. Uh, well, so that, that's Doctor Strange Love. I, I love that movie. I mean, that that's a movie that right now I could just I could just put it on, and it's just it, it's the uh, the gift that keeps giving. Mm -hmm. They cannot. Uh, what is it? They're they're poisoning our precious bodily fluids. <laughs> 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 and fluoride does reduce iq it's been proven yeah. there was a yeah. harvard study so it was yeah. you know uh yeah. any maybe there's some truth maybe maybe uh jack t ripper was on to something i'm sure he uh, was maybe he knew um so now we're going to get into the four great films uh, obviously we're already you know some great great movies but he's doing doing these um you know working working from home as it is mm -hmm. um and now we're going to get into this period of just absolute, absolute groundbreaking cinema. And now I'm going to read from this um, Vincent Labruto um, book. I'm going to read some business about um, 2001. Brad, what do you know about the making of 2001, A Space Odyssey? What do you... Oh, I guess I don't know a, a whole lot about the actual production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so 
he, this is, I love 2001 um, for the, the fact that he and Arthur C. Clarke got together and decided to essentially co-write the novel mm-hmm. uh, and agreed that there would be a novel that would pair with the book. Uh, yeah. And so this is going to get us back to a previous subject from, for Art of Darkness, artofdarkpod.com. Uh, Kubrick placed Arthur C. Clarke in his center, so they decided to work on the movie mm-hmm. and, the, and the corresponding novel. Mm-hmm. Placed uh, Clark in his Central Park West office with an electric typewriter and plenty of blank paper, but o- after only one day under the director's scrutiny, so they're splitting time between New York and London, Clark quietly withdrew to the more suitable literary atmosphere at the Chelsea Hotel, <laughs> uh, where he was stimulated to create in the company of Arthur Miller, Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs, all of huh. whom resided at, in the che- at the Chelsea in the flesh. Huh. Uh, in addition to being the hotel of choice for many of Andy Warhol's superstars, the Chelsea also became the place where Naked Lunch and 2001 were written. Hmm. Take me back. Yeah. Right? Oh, <laughs> right. I just want to go back to There's the Chelsea gotta, Hotel oh in the God. 60s. There's got to be a documentary about that hotel, right? Incredible. Just yeah, that's, incredible. that's amazing. Well, so going on from this bio, he's, he, the biographer writes that Kubrick and Clark were at opposite ends of the spectrum when it came to working and resting patterns. Arthur and Stanley were very interesting foils. Uh, Roger Karras told Neil Mc, McAllier, uh, who is uh, Clark's biographer. There was some slight conflict in that Arthur goes to bed very early. Arthur gets very tired and typically 9 to 9.30 is his bedtime. Stanley goes to bed about three in the morning and sleeps until about three in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> so they called this a good cerebral marriage. I think I read that Arthur C. Clarke said that nobody, nobody good stays up past 10 o'clock and anybody up <laughs> after midnight is a criminal, something like that. <laughs> so these are different guys. Yeah, right? yeah. And of course, when we think of 2001, the mind lights up with the, all the extraordinary um, things about the film. It's just so iconic and essential. Oh. Um, it's one of the few like sci-fi. It's one of the few sci-fi films that holds up effects wise over the course of like, what is it? It's 50 years old now, practically. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just the fact that it even looks good anyway, still is it's, impressive. It's, it's a definitive film. Um, I yeah. have a couple of interesting personal anecdotes about 2001. One of my buddies from the uh, restaurant that I used to frequent in Manhattan claimed to have worked on the special effects for 2001. Oh, really? He worked on the models. Wow. Uh, he had also worked on special effects for practical effects for, mm. uh, for Rosemary's Baby. Wow. And I have no reason to to think that he was uh, BSing. He he hated Kubrick. If you would bring up Kubrick, he would <laughs> he would give you this look because apparently Kubrick would call them at eight in the morning sharp. Yeah, and talk and talk right. and talk right. and talk. Yeah. And he had uh, he had <laughs> lots and lots of notes and lots of ideas about how these model spaceships were going to look. Right. right, right. Uh, the other anecdote I have comes from a screening at the United Palace in Washington Heights, which is this great old cinema in the Heights, uh, which they've restored and they show maybe a dozen films a year. I wish they showed more, but they show classics. And the actor who played, I'm ashamed to say, I can't remember if it was Poole or Bowman. Uh, I think it might have been Poole, uh, okay. who played the astronaut, essentially, who goes up into um into uh, orbit and space and all that talks about a moment in 2001 that he and his wife noticed only after years of watching and rewatching the film. Because of course, if you're in the film, you know, you're probably going to watch it. Uh, Maybe not. I don't know. It's not like I listen back to this podcast uh, compulsively, but uh, there's a moment in the uh, orbital way station where the, the character, I think it's just before he speaks with his daughter on the, mm. on the teleprompter or on the, on the TV. That daughter is Kubrick's daughter, by the way. Oh, uh, really? That girl okay. is Kubrick's huh. girl. Um, huh. He meets with the other, uh, or he meets with officials at a little 
station there, right? Like they're, they're all sitting around, they're all, they've got their feet up and they're all talking about what's happening and how X, Y, Z is classified and all the rest. Yeah. There is a moment where there is a red, I think it's a red sweater, might be a blue sweater. There's a sweater or like a scarf or a shawl or something that's hanging over the, uh, the um, couch that they're sitting on. And in one shot, it's there. And in the next shot, it's gone. So he made a continuity error. If you listen, maybe 10 seconds after that scene, there is an announcement over the speaker saying that someone has lost a red sweater and can they find it in their lost and found. He covered his continuity error with a little bit of voiceover. Right. That's the level of detail and obsessiveness and perfection that we're dealing with here. I, lo- I love it. I love this. Now, so reading from the Labruto uh, biography, Kubrick had the reputation of being cool and unemotional toward many he worked with. At one point, Tony Master's son came down with a serious case of the croup and Kubrick ordered an inhaler flown in from the U.S., the, the logical computer-like mind of Stanley Kubrick employed reason to solve every problem in front of him. His emotional life was more difficult to interpret. He worked hard, shoulder to shoulder with his crew, moving a piece of equipment when necessary, and lying on the floor to get a low angle shot. His emotions went into the synapses of his brain and were translated into visions. Stanley's a genius, Roger Karras told Piers Bizzani. I've known maybe five or six in my life, and I include Arthur Clarke in this as well. This, well, they have a monster inside of them that's eating them alive, and that's their frontal lobes. They must feed this thing constantly, and they can't tolerate boredom. That's what drives them on to yet greater depths of understanding, of digging. Stanley's basically secretive, a very private person. He's tolerant and unassuming. He doesn't lord it over others, but understanding something 20 minutes before anybody else in the room does and having an incredible memory that probes to unbelievable believable depths when he is interested in something, that tends to make Stanley seem quiet and reserved unless you know him well. But he has a really wonderful sense of humor when he's relaxed with some. And of course, he has this absolutely insatiable curiosity. So Dang. quite an endorsement uh, uh, from yeah. from one of his one of his colleagues here. Um, hmm. wow. Yeah, it's really hard to beat. You know, when you're thinking about um, 2001, it's really hard to to think of a greater um, a greater film. Uh, it's it's deep, and I don't just throw that term around. I mean, there's a lot of deep films, but this is like a this is like a going back to the beginning of it covers the entire span of human history. You know what I mean? Like, yes, from literally hominids to some sort of psychological apocalypse that I, I don't think anybody actually understands the star child. Right. Well, and, and he talks about this here in the bio, the bold opening of 2001 was his way of linking the past with the future. Uh, Kubrick told someone, Somebody said that man is the missing link between primitive apes and civilized human beings. You might say that the idea is inherent in the story of 2001 too. We are semi-civilized, capable of cooperation and affection, but needing some sort of transfiguration into a higher form of life. Mm -hmm. Since the means to obliterate life on earth exists, it will take more than just careful planning and reasonable cooperation to avoid some eventual catastrophe. The problem exists as long as the potential exists and the problem is essentially a moral and spiritual one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's still with 2001 concerned about nuclear war. Yeah, but he's taking it to like a, a, a metaphysical level, essentially. Absolutely. Which is, well, which, which is I, I think, nuclear catastrophe, it was a spot where history sort of touched theology or metaphysics in a way. Cause it was mm. this sort of like, we could have just destroyed everything. Yeah. You know, and we didn't, but well, I mean, and now we're dealing with a situation where do we know if COVID was made in a lab? Are we ever right. going to know? Right. Is right. this the new yeah. nuclear well, weapon? Are we I mean, you're new- a conspiracy theorist for even bringing it up. Even though right. how dare I 
seems the point. Well, we'll get into the direction. conspiracy theory about Kubrick and the moon landing briefly. I know this is, we're going to go a little long here, Brad. Yeah, well, we're, it's Kubrick, so yeah. We're going a little long. Well, so the book was published in 68 and uh, 2001, which he co-wrote with uh, Clark, sold more than 4 million copies and they share a 60-40 deal with the book. What a unique filmmaker to be able to accomplish that. Uh, so the, yeah. if, you've, if you've never read the book, but you've seen the film, do read the book, then go back and watch the film because it will deepen your appreciation for what was done with the film. Uh, now I wanna read about the reviews for 2001. Uh, it was apparent that most establishment critics were not prepared to deal with a new kind of American film. Uh, in the New Republic, Stanley Kaufman called 2001 a film that is so dull, it even dulls our interest in the technical ingenuity for the sake of which Kubrick has allowed it to become dull. He is so infatuated with te uh, technology of film and of the future that it has numbed his formerly keen feel for attention span. Um, in Vogue, Arthur Sch Schlesinger Jr. said, it is morally pretentious, intellectually obscure, and inordinately long. The concluding statement is too private, too profound, or perhaps too shallow for immediate comprehension. Uh, Peter Davis Dribble in Women's Wear Daily sniped, writing for Women's Wear Daily. Uh, 2001, <laughs> 2001 is not the worst film I've ever seen. It's simply the dullest. And in the New York Times, uh, Renata Adler wrote, the movie is so completely absorbed in its own problems, its use of color and space, its fanatical devotion to science fiction detail, that it is somewhere between hypnotic and immensely boring. Uh, and it goes on. There are yeah. other... Oh, yeah. Uh, I can see, I imagine, I can only imagine that critics would poo-poo it hard. Well, yeah. What happened? <laughs> so, but it was the younger people who saved the movie. At one screening, a young man ran down the aisle during the Stargate sequence and crashed through the screen, screaming, "I see God!" The smell of, of <laughs> well, burning, he was on acid. Uh, <laughs> burning marijuana permeated theaters packed with young people. Their yeah. pupils dilated. Their minds stimulated with the power of pure film. <laughs> uh, Kubrick at one point right here um, claimed, uh, he told Rolling Stone, on the other hand, well, let's see here. He said, I have to say that I, it was never meant to represent an acid trip, Kubrick told mm -hmm. this Rolling Stone. On the other hand, a connection does exist. An acid trip is probably similar to the kind of mind boggling experience that might occur at the moment of encountering extraterrestrial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I've been put off, uh, putting off experimenting with LSD because I don't like what seems to happen to people who try it. They seem to develop what I can only describe as an illusion of understanding and oneness with the universe. This is a phenomenon which they can't articulate in any logical way, but which they express emotionally. They seem very happy, very contented, and very pleased with the state of mind, but at the same time, they seem to be totally unaware of the fact that it deprives them of any kind of self-criticism, which is, of course, absolutely essential for an hmm. artist to have. It's very dangerous to be zonked out by everything that you see and think of and to believe all of your ideas are of cosmic proportions. I should think that if one had no interest in being an artist, this illusion of understanding would be delightful. But for myself, I think it is a pleasure which I'll forgo for as long as I'm interested in making films. Huh. Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, you could maybe have... Uh, in your imagination, this idea of maybe Kubrick tripping out, but apparently not. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, it doesn't surprise me that he would have been a totally, totally dry. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, maybe I he it, drank a little he bit. He had or beers whatever, and but, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't surprise me that he, because he, he just has, he's, he's an obsessive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I say that with all due respect, you know, it's yeah. just, he's well, not so, going what else can you say about 2001? It's tremendous. It's worth watching. Uh, it's considered one of the finest films of all time. Oh, yeah, and it's been super influential. I mean, uh, it not, um, I was going to say Inception. Interstellar was an attempt to make a new, in my opinion, to, an attempt to make a, a new 2001. As a new 2001, it's kind of ham-fisted. As a film in its own right, it's it's... I think it's pretty good, but, uh, and I, I still can't get over the image of Arthur C. Clarke going to the Chelsea hotel where William yeah. Burroughs and Ginsburg, yeah. uh, are yeah. living and 
to try and get some peace. Yeah, to get a little uh, <laughs> literary I- inspiration yeah, for this, yeah, no, this that's masterpiece. Great. That's great. I need to reread that book. Well, we're going to continue, and I'm going to blast through some things here. Uh, this is the period after um, 2001 uh, where he – it was – oh, by the way, it was uh, – oh, wait, no, uh, that's A Clockwork Orange. I take that back. Um, we'll get to A Clockwork Orange here shortly. Kubrick always wanted to make a film about Napoleon and that obsessed him for years, but it was never uh, to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, For what it's worth, I I couldn't tell the biography of his his life without mentioning that. It just never manifests itself. Uh, It's like Yodorovsky's Dune. Mm -hmm. It's a project that just never got off the ground. It was too big. He was trying to get 40,000 extras uh, to actually do the battles. Right. (laughs) Right? It was just too, (laughs) too big. Um, I, you know, at this point, Kubrick is living, still living in England. uh, And he would, he would test people when he would meet people. And he would often do this on sets uh, or when he would meet actors, he would challenge them to chess um, in order to kind of dominate them and yeah. to assert himself, assert his authority. Uh, but he would also challenge people to, uh, to ping pong. Uh, here, here's a memory. He had a ping pong table at his, pl- at his place in England. Bob Gaffney remembered many memorable ping pong games on the lawn at Kubrick's home. And he said, he and I were playing one day and we got bored. So we were hitting the ball up in the air and running way back and swatting it. He stepped into a hole and I heard a crack. Stanley broke his ankle. He was in bed for months. I still have a vision of him sitting in his bedroom with a ruler down inside the cast, scratching it. Oh, God. Bad break. Uh, there's another story about Kubrick where he came to distrust doctors. Okay. Didn't like doctors very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to the point where he had to have some oral surgery. And they flew in a dentist from New York and had him operate at, I think it was like, an American Naval hospital or something, because that was the only place he was allowed to operate. Um, I just think that's a funny story. So yeah, yeah. I think we're moving into kind of like mad genius territory here. Fly in the dentist for me. Right, 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 right. Yeah. It's a Howard, that is like a Howard Hughes move. A little bit, a little bit. I I think that we can, we can safely say that, um, you know, that that's the case. Uh, Yeah. I have it right here. It was, uh, the procedure was pre- performed in the embassy's naval dentist chair. <laughs> the only facility in which the New York licensed dentists could legally practice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're, so I like this. This is also very, very Kubrick, right? The horse yeah. moves two and then one, right? We, right. We're going to follow the rules, right? But, but we're definitely flying my yeah. dentist over from, right. from New York. <laughs> uh, well, so now we have to have a little bit of the old ultraviolence, Brad. Mm. Uh, I think we have to talk about the great film, A Clockwork Orange. And uh, what's your what's your memory of A Clockwork Orange? Do you recall the first time you, oh, you yeah. saw that film? I, I mean, now that we're going through this, I feel like I have a, a Kubrick film for like each phase of my post-adolescent life. Of your, your descent into de- degeneracy yeah. here? Yeah, Your descent yeah. into podcasting? Yeah, so Clockwork Orange was like 19 to 22 when it was just like, I mean, I wasn't a violent person by any means, but mm. I was a hellraiser. And, you know, me and my droogs, uh, not my droogs, we were (laughs) co-drooging around. Um, But yeah, you know, go out and raise some hell and like get into some get into some situations that you might not be able to get out of and and, you know, live to tell the tale. So Clockwork Orange fit right in there. Well, and I think there'll that'll come back here shortly. Uh, he made the film. It was released in seventy one. It was done on only a budget of two million pounds. Hmm. Uh, he abandoned the use of Cinemascope. He did a one six six one widescreen format. Uh, according to one of his colleagues, he thought that was an acceptable compromise between spectacle and intimacy, okay. and it favored his symmetrical framing. Mm. which you can see in that movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So what can we say about A Clockwork Orange? Uh, it's based on a novel by Anthony Burgess. And I'm going to quote him. 
uh, Burgess, it was the most painful thing I've ever written, that damn book, told the village voice. I was trying to exercise the memory of what happened to my first wife, who is savagely attacked in London during the Second World War by four American deserters. She was pregnant at the time and lost our child. This led to a dreadful depression and her suicide attempt. After that, I had to learn to start loving again. Writing that book, getting it all out was a way of doing it. I was very drunk when I wrote it. It was the only way I could cope with the violence. I can't stand violence. I loathe it. And one feels so responsible putting an act of violence down on paper. If one can put an act of violence down on paper, you've created the act. You might as well have done it. I detest that damn book now. Whoa. Yeah. So Dang. we're dealing with something that's uh, pretty heavy. Yeah. And the central idea of the book, of course, is that is it ethical to reform someone in order to fit them into society if the re the reforming takes away their free will? Right, right. Yeah, that's sort of the third act of the film, right? And, mm -hmm. and beyond the, the this general hell raising and all that that appealed to me at a certain age. Now it's a it's a meme, the the brainwashing scene of um oh, what is the chief character's name? I'm Alex. forgetting now. Alex. Um you know, the brainwashing scene has become somewhat meme worthy and for good mm -hmm. reason. It's an iconic scene, the peeling back of the eyelid and the adding the drops so that they can keep watching without mm -hmm. a blink. And mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh very interesting, very interesting film, very difficult film. Uh I, I think it's funny. Burgess only made, I think, a couple of hundred dollars. He sold the rights. He didn't see any money oh. for the for the rights. Although, of course, it made his book um, internationally famous, and I'm sure he made a lot of money from yeah. from that. Um, so there, there's a great scene that people don't talk about in that towards the end with Malcolm. What's the name of the actor? Is it Malcolm, Malcolm McDowell? McDowell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he gets dunked into like a trough of water or something. Yeah, they actually it, used broth. They actually use beef broth for the, it, the effect. And he is under for a very long time, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Yes. Like it's unnervingly long period yes. of time with no cut that he is underwater. Right. Yeah. Well, that's actually something I want to talk about uh, because uh, he, he very nearly got, he very nearly drowned. He got, he very Did nearly he? got hurt. Yes. Um, when they, when they stomp on his um, chest in that, in the scene where he's being humiliated in front of the, um, uh, the functionaries, mm -hmm. uh, he had, he had ribs broken Jeez. as a consequence of that. Wow. Uh, and then yes, the business with the, um, the, uh, the drowning. I mean, it was, it was dangerous. Well, yeah. if that was post, was that after, I mean, if that's post getting your ribs broken, it, you probably can't hold your breath for quite as long. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, Right. Get your lungs to capacity, probably. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so there was a re some re really serious stuff that happened on that film. Um, there's a quote that I want to uh, give you from Malcolm McDowell. He said of Kubrick, he is everything. I loved him. I hated him. I went through every emotion with him. But the thing that I really remember is that when I would do something, he would ram his handkerchief into his mouth. He was laughing so much. And there is nothing more adrenaline giving to an actor than seeing a director stuff his mouth with his handkerchief. <laughs> Louis Bunuel said, a clockwork, a clockwork Orange is my current favorite. I was very predisposed against the film. After seeing it, I realized it is the only movie about what the modern world really means. Mm. And here's the drummer for the uh, Sex Pistols, Paul Cook. I hate reading. I can't stand it. I only ever read two books, one about the Cray Brothers and A Clockwork Orange. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me read a few quotes from, uh, from people about this. So this is Stephen, uh, Steve Southgate, the VP in charge of European Technical Operations for Warner Brothers. Uh, he worked with all... Kubrick picture. He worked on all Kubrick pictures from A Clockwork Orange forward. He was one person in the film industry who knew how the film industry worked. In every country in the world, he knew all of, of the dubbing people, the dubbing directors, the actors. He had relationships with foreign directors who would supervise his work because he couldn't be there to supervise himself. We had to go around to every cinema to make sure the projection lights were right, the sound was correct, the ratios were right, the screens were clean. 
He seemed to work 24 hours a day. We used to get calls all hours of the night. He could be very difficult, but not in a difficult way. If you ever got chewed out by Stanley on the phone, you knew you'd been chewed out. He never screamed or yelled, but he had this wonderful manner and a sort of lovely New York drawl to his voice that you knew you were being carpeted. If he had any criticism of his film, he took it terribly personally. It was body and soul to him. Hmm. Ken Adam, I think he had quite a shock from the violent reactions to A Clockwork Orange, even though it was at the time the most successful picture he had done. Um, and Jan Harlan, because the reaction to A Clockwork Orange was very sharp and, and in many cases, very, very negative. Jan Harlan, who's- Oh, a I producer, imagine people mm, thought it was dangerous as a film. It, we're going to get to that in just okay. a minute. Yeah, Jan Harlan, uh, his uh, brother-in-law and production assistant, uh, said he felt very misunderstood about A Clockwork Orange, uh, very insulted. Well, A Clockwork Orange, upon release, um, received an X, an X rating uh, because huh. of the, uh, the, the rape menage scene. a trois. Yeah. And the oh. fact that it, yes. And the fact that it was fast forwarded, I think I have a quote here somewhere uh, where it was fast forwarded he, the, the argument was, well, any pornographer could then simply fast forward sex scenes uh, and release them in wide release and hope for an R rating. Um, well, here, here we are. So about, about McDowell, um, during the shooting, McDowell's ribs were broken when the actor playing the provocateur stomped too hard. Later in the film, Alex again meets up with two of his former droogs, now policemen, in a very long take with no cutaways, they hold Alex in a trough filled with dirty water. McDowell actually performed the stunt immersing his head in beef broth and oh. nearly suffocated while holding his breath for the long take. Yeah. Incredible. The oh. most difficult scenes to shoot were the Ludovico treatment sequences. McDowell's eyes were held open with clamps as Alex watched the violent films used to purge him. Quoting Kubrick, we used a piece of standard surgical equipment called a lid lock. Oh. Oh, I think, I think, I think that's going to be the title of this episode. I think it's going to be Stanley Kubrick's Lidlock. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. It, it took courage. And what a did local, they use that for like eye surgery? Probably. Yeah. They yeah. Would, maybe they would anesthetize you or. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It took courage and a local anesthetic for him to wear them. I can assure you he didn't like it at all. And we never really got it finished the first time he had to go back and face it again at the end. Oh, he had God. to do it. The scene wouldn't have been credible otherwise. One of the worst fantasies you can imagine is being in a straitjacket, strapped to a chair, and unable to even blink your eyes. Oh, <laughs> whoa, doggy! Yeah, that's. Oh that's man, rough. I think one thing that's worth noting too is how much time he would take on these films. He was meticulous. Uh, I'm reading here that uh, when Alex does "Singing in the Rain." Uh, it took three days to work it out. Wow. Uh, the, the move and the, dan the dancing, the rape scene, right? Yeah. Uh, he would call them CRMs, critical rehearsal moment, a time, a point in time when the director and actors come together to create a dis defining scene in the film. Hmm. Uh, wow. Yeah, this is a funny quote. During the shooting, Malcolm McDowell was invited to Kensington Palace for a lunch hosted by Princess Margaret. When McDowell asked Kubrick if he could be released, Kubrick replied, ah, Malik, I don't want to shut down the whole unit a day just for her. <laughs> <laughs> so your lead actor has been invited by royalty to a lunch. Nah, yeah. you, I mean, we got a schedule to keep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Apparently, McDowell scratched the cornea of his left eye. Oh, I imagine. oh my God. Incredible. Yeah. So that love hate relationship must've been quite real. Yeah. I can only imagine, but you got to think, I mean, if you're into acting cause you love it, mm -hmm. right? Like you got to know at this point, Kubrick is a legend already. I'm sure. Um, and you know, coming off 2001 and Malcolm McDowell is kind of young. There's part of him is probably like, I will do anything to make this film. I think so Kubrick too. Wants. I yeah. think so too. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, so we have to talk about the way that this film was received. Uh, so A Clockwork Orange received an X rating from the MPAA, the dreaded letter that we, was used to label hardcore pornography. So Dr. Stern of the rating board explained, 
Uh, Dr. Stern was right. His name? Yeah, Stern, S T E R N, right? That's fun, quite right? An apt in them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I flew to London to talk to Stanley about the X rating. I love this too. This is a this is a time where, well, Stanley Kubrick has a new new film, and I have to fly to London now to sit with him and talk about the X rating that we're giving him. Now they right. would do it over Zoom, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the world has ended. Um, at first, he was angry, but I told him that we couldn't give Clockwork an, or, uh, an R just because he had speeded up the camera on that menage a trois scene. Because if we did that, that any hardcore pornographer could speed up his scenes and legitimately ask for an R on the same basis. We would have created a precedent. By the time we finished talking, Stanley saw my point. Mm-hmm. Stern was frustrated. Uh, he wished there was a special rating, but they had to do it. Now, uh, in England, it was given a certificate by the Board of Film Censors, which rated the film restricted to under 18. Mm-hmm. Now, this, the film was nominated for four uh, uh, Academy Awards, uh, including Best Picture, but it was the year The French Connection came out, so there really wasn't much hope for it. It was, all, it was only nominated for one technical um, area, the, for film, uh, film editor, and it didn't win. Now... This is very interesting. Uh, the reaction to this film was pretty pretty visceral. Uh, they wouldn't even publish ads. Many of the papers wouldn't even publish ads for it because of the X rating. Uh, the Village Voice did, but many other papers wouldn't do it. Uh, so at, it was mm-hmm. released on an X rating in the it United was, States. It okay. was, re- was released on an X rating. Mm. Um, the outrage centered around the joy that the characters felt about their violence. That was the problem, uh, according, according to Kubrick. Mm-hmm. Um, they, he said, when you ask, is it right for violence to be fun, you must realize that people are used to challenging whether certain types of, va- of violence are fun. You see it when your Western hero finally shoots all the villains. Heroic violence in the Hollywood sense is a great deal like the motivational researcher's problem in selling candy. The problem with candy is not to convince people that it's good candy, but to free them from the guilt of eating it. We have seen so many times that the body of a film serves merely as an excuse for motivating a final blood crazed slaughter by the hero of his enemies, and at the same time to relieve the audience's guilt of enjoying the mayhem. So that film doesn't operate that way. This isn't a hero in the Wild West who finally gets to kill all the baddies at the end and everyone feels justified right. at Maybe. such violence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it did reach a point where Kubrick, because I want to move on, but it did reach a point where Kubrick willing, willingly withdrew the film uh, from circulation um, in 1974. Um, well, here, A Clockwork Orange... <laughs> well, here. It, well, anyway, A Clockwork Orange had a chilling effect on England. Critics and community groups were appalled by the film's violence. Copycat crimes of rape and murder were attributed to it. Young mm. men in Great Britain were seen marauding the streets dressed like Alex and the Droogs. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no that's not what you want you missed the point opposite yeah it's the yeah. op the point is not that so in 74 Kubrick concerned about the real life violent acts attributed to viewing a clockwork orange pulled the film from distribution in England and he hmm. had a self-imposed ban hmm. uh on the work and um Jeez. yeah so pretty intense uh, yeah. and I think it speaks to the quality of his work, uh, that, I mean, we, we should all hope to have something that obviously you don't want people to be committing acts of violence. Well, based I was going to say, but yeah, people are dressing as your characters and going out and acting it out. Like that's, yeah, that's, it, it impacted people, whether it had the impact you wanted to or not is without a doubt. I just yeah. incredible. Well, so up after a clockwork orange, uh, is the great film Barry Lyndon? Uh, mm. Are you familiar with Barry Lyndon? I am familiar with Barry Lyndon. Yeah, yeah. Such a such a high contrast to go from oh, yeah. a Clockwork Orange to Barry Lyndon. This I just think it shows such a range and such a strong quality. Uh, in one of the documentaries, the the actress who plays Barry Lyndon's cousin 
uh, with the red ribbon at the very beginning. She her her chest is out and her her breasts are sort of on full display. Uh-huh. Uh, apparently, on 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 set one day, he made a comment saying, uh, you know, you know, sorry, sorry, uh, you know, I'm, the angle is wrong on on your chest. Can you lift? Can you lift one? You know, and reposition. And yeah, she did. You know, and then. Yeah. And then he said, "Oh, I'm sorry. The angle is is wrong in the other one. Can you sort of adjust the second one?" Yeah. And she did, and and he kind of like winked at uh, everybody. Cracked up apparently on set. <laughs> I mean, of course, a little bit impro- inappropriate, but she was yeah. laughing about it as well. Yeah. So for what yeah. it's worth, he had a, he had a good sense of humor. It's just a good little bit of lad humor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're you're gonna make the movie. That scene with the ribbon uh, is is a pretty wonderful mm-hmm. sequence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Barry Lyndon. There's all of the lore about the uh, the incredible uh, lighting by candle mm-hmm. uh, by candlelight that was done for that film. It's a very um, unique looking film. There's nothing yeah. else like it. Yeah. Uh, and you know the chapter in this book is called Candle Power, uh, <laughs> and and the custom len- lenses that had to be acquired for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the you know, the French uh, love the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, apparently, it was uh, a box office failure. It mm. didn't even make ten million dollars, but it was a thirty million dollar budget. Um, it put off a lot of critics and audiences. It's three hours plus. Mm. It's notoriously quote unquote slow. It's mm-hmm. based on a novel by William Makepeace Thackeray. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, just challenging, very in contrast to A Clockwork Orange. Um, it did get seven Academy Award nominations. It won wow. four. Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography, Best Costume Design, Best Musical how, Score. How, how long did it take them to make that? Or, or I guess shoot it? Well, so it was done in 75. It looks like they began in 72, uh, okay. I think this, I read that the shooting took eight months. Okay. Uh, yeah. One of the stories that I like about this, and we're coming up shortly on the shining uh, as mm-hmm. we're getting into the, we're, we're getting into the home stretch here. Uh, one of the stories I like is that the actress who played, I think lady Lyndon, uh, I think he encouraged her and she sort of agreed to stay out of the sun for six months <laughs> in order to be pale. pale That's could... the look, right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you couldn't do that. You couldn't just do that with makeup. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Of course not. You have to be in keeping with the, the period. Um, yeah. The film, the film's legacy is held up extremely well. Uh, mm-hmm. Roger Ebert referred to it as one of the most beautifully, uh, one of the most beautiful films ever made. Certainly in every frame, a Kubrick film, technically awesome, emotionally mm-hmm. distant, remorseful mm-hmm. in its doubt of human goodness. Mm. Um Hmm, so, I like that phrase, remorseful in its doubt of human goodness. Yeah, remorseless in its doubt. Yeah, oh, remorseless. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me see if I have anything about... Uh, ah, so here's an anecdote from the set of uh, Barry Lyndon. I quite like this. We're talking about continuity from earlier. Yeah. Uh, they were having some trouble with one of the scenes where cards are being dealt. Uh so let me see here. And this is quoting one of the actors saying, I was mainly a theater actor then. I'd been hacking it for 10 years. And as San- Stanley is doing all this, I'm saying to myself, this isn't going to happen to me. So I'm building up readiness like a fighter to ready for the scene, right? This goes on and on. Uh, we have breaks. And then Stanley said, Pat, we'll just do the close up for Ju. And it's a French word that the actor's struggling with. Then we'll do the hands separately because I know it's difficult for you. So it's, they're dealing cards, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, When Stanley just shot Pat's hands, they had gotten sweaty again. So he said, we can't use your hands, Pat. So I thought they can't shoot his hands. What are they going to do? So what Stanley did was he got on the the phone to England and asked for, for a magician to come just to deal the cards. (laughs) So yes, we give had me a, a magician. Bring me a magician up. from England. <laughs> right. It gets better. So we had a break, and along comes David Burglis, who is a marvelous magician, and Stanley just photographs his hands. David's hands are beautiful, and the cards swiftly leave his hands as from jet propulsion. Stanley is happy, and then they go back to Pat because you see Pat's hands in the medium shot, but they don't match. 
So Stanley says to Pat, you have to shave your hands, Pat, because his <laughs> hands are hairy. <laughs> So Pat, who is this great star actor, a powerhouse yeah. who has worked with Peter Brook, who yeah. Peter Brook's a great theater director, mm. um, has to adapt to the stand-in rather than putting some hair on the hands of the stand-in. Mm. They already shot Burglis's smooth, creamy white hands, the hands of a man who's a master of prestidigitation, and they yeah. had to shave Pat's hands. <laughs> <laughs> Pat came in the next day with his naked hands and had to do <laughs> je again. That was that. Then they did the reverse on me with the girls. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> we're going to, for this one brief sequence, we're yep. flying in a magician yep. and yep. you're shaving your hands. Yeah. I, I, I know Kubrick probably wasn't like this, like in mannerism, but I like to just imagine him picking up the phone and saying, yes, England, send me a magician and then hanging up. <laughs> Just like no explanation. Right. Quickly, somebody over in London puts it all together, sends him a magician. Mm. Yeah. I mean, That's just great. absolutely incredible. For this movie that like, you know, just hemorrhaged money. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Well, so like his other films, the reaction was mixed. Uh, it's a bit of a bit of a challenging film. Definitely worth watching. It's the kind of thing you can sit sit and watch in two parts. Uh, there's no pressure to watch it all in one sitting. Uh, I think it's a wonderful film. So that's that for Barry Lyndon. Uh, and now we're going to move forward to the next film, which should be familiar to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's The Shining mm -hmm. in 1980. Uh, yeah. Which, what, you know, what can you really say about The Shining based on the novel by Stephen King? Uh, yeah. Here's Stephen King on Kubrick. He's kind of a dyspeptic filmmaker, a type A filmmaker, worrying and wanting to edit right up to the end. He's very painstaking, obviously. You know what? I think he wants to hurt people with this movie. I think that he really wants to make a movie that will hurt people. And then here's Jack Nicholson uh, saying, Stanley's good on sound, so are a lot of directors, but Stanley's good on designing a new harness. Stanley's good on the color of the mic. Stanley's good about the merchant he bought the mic from. Stanley's good about the merchant's daughter who needs some dental work. So <laughs> a real stunning yeah. uh, endorsement of Kubrick. And I, yeah. at this point, I think the I should have, I hope I've painted a picture of a man who is very busy with the business of film. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. a diva, yeah. uh, certainly a megalomaniac of some kind, mm -hmm. but he can back it up. Right. He's got the talent for it. Yeah. Without yeah. a doubt. Uh, a few facts about The Shining that I enjoy. Uh, there's, of course, the conspiracy theory that years earlier, Stanley Kubrick helped fake the moon landing mm -hmm. or uh, shot the footage that was used for the yeah. moon landing fakery. Now, this rumor was already circulating by the time he made The Shining. Oh, so, it was. okay. Yeah. So it could be a case where he put in these little Easter eggs to taunt people about the rumor. Nice. Or it could be a confession. Right. Do we know? I yeah. don't know. But yeah. you can see the documentary Room 237, which is about people who are obsessed with The Shining, which is, of mm -hmm. course, a film about obsession. And I, I quite like that documentary. It's a great documentary. Lot. Yeah, It's really good. And, yeah. uh, you know, of course, you have Danny who stands up with the Apollo 11 rocket yeah. on his sweater. Yeah. Uh, he, Kubrick changed the room number from 217 to 237. The moon is 237,000 miles from Earth. Right. Right. Uh, if we're to believe that, that Earth, the Earth isn't flat yeah. uh, and so forth. There are all these wonderful little uh, tidbits. Um, the film is just this incredible haunted house. You can watch the film 20 times. Oh God, it's so and, good. It's so good. And it just gets deeper and deeper. Uh, I showed it to my daughter recently, my 12 year old daughter. We <laughs> nice. watched it. Normally she's very, that's a good age to watch The Shining for the okay. first time. Normally yeah. uh, she's very, uh, I don't even know what you call her generation. She's not a Zoomer, but whatever that next generation is, mm -hmm. she might be like a Zoomer next gen cusp. In, in any case, uh, she's very on her tablet and very on her phones. Yeah. Not for this movie. No. Boom. <laughs> she yeah. was in it. Yeah, and, when, it and, when, in. and when it was over, she looked at me and she said, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't mean in the plot. She meant like 
emotionally in her own brain, probably. <laughs> right. So many things about that film. Dude, one thing I, I mm-hmm. and this is something I, I've seen that movie probably five times, maybe six times. One thing I caught on the second to last that just blew my mind is when Jack Nicholson's character goes in to do the interview to get the job. Yes. Right. This isn't at the hotel. This is at some office or something. He goes that, in. That is at the hotel, though. It, it is in the is hotel. Is it at the hotel? Yes, it is okay. in the hotel. Mm-hmm. So he, but he goes into this room and there's this window on, from the office out mm-hmm. onto this area where it's literally geometrically impossible for that window to be there. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I know that's on purpose. And yes. I just found it this fascinating, like, slight crank on what reality is going to be for this entire, he, entire film. You really have to watch Room 237 if you want to yeah. see that film in a new light. There yeah. are so many hidden messages in it yeah. and subliminals, and it was all done very intentionally. And yeah. one of the people who's interviewed in that says, Barry Lyndon is a boring movie. Stanley needed something to come back from Barry Lyndon. Now, of course, I don't think Barry Lyndon is a boring movie. I think it's a masterpiece, but it is right. a very different film from The Shining. And Yeah, uh, yeah but Barry yeah. Lyndon doesn't keep you in like, a constant state of like right heart attack right yes yeah. like the shining does yeah uh yeah. i i found this fascinating a couple of anecdotes on the set nicholson always appeared in character his legendary arched eyebrows which almost matched his directors were in constant motion up and down left and right he expressed the playful manic and malevolent persona within Holding court with the crew and addressing the visiting documentary camera of Vivian Kubrick, Nicholson displayed his devilish wit and bad boy grin. The part of Jack Torrance was extremely physical, so Nicholson often whipped himself up into a frenzy by jumping up and down, spewing bile out loud as he prepared for a take. You can see that documentary that Vivian Kubrick made of the making of The Shining, and you can get a behind-the-scenes look. I think it's about 30 minutes long. He uh, he improvised uh, Here's Johnny. Oh, he did. Uh, okay. Yeah. Pretty cool that Kubrick was yeah. able to sort of allow that, um, yeah. that to come through. Now, uh, there is a story that he abused <laughs> Shelley Duvall on the set. Uh, I'm quoting from a website I found. In order to give The Shining the psychological horror it needed, director Stanley Kubrick antagonized his actors. The film script was changed so often that Jack Nicholson stopped reading each draft. Kubrick intentionally isolated Shelley Duvall and argued with her often. Duvall was forced to perform the iconic and exhausting baseball bat scene 127 times. Oh, my God. Afterwards, Duvall uh, presented Kubrick with clumps of hair that had fallen out due to extreme stress of filming. Oh, my God. Clumps of hair fell out as a consequence of making this movie. Uh, now I have a quote here from from Shelley. I mean, Let me see if I can find it. She went on to lose her mind. Not saying it's necessarily related to this, but like flash forward 20 years and Shelley Duvall is not mentally well. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. Well, so here it's written Kubrick maintained a, psycholo- a psychological advantage over Shelley Duvall by making her feel she wasn't giving him what he wanted, that she was holding everyone up. Kubrick wanted Duvall to use this harassment for her role as Wendy, but the gentle natured actress had an I- idiosyncratic style that didn't flourish under per- uh, personal pressure. Kubrick felt Duvall was overreacting in the scene when she hides in the bathroom while Jack threatens to axe the door down. Shelley, the only part clearly wrong was at the end when you said, we've got to get him out of here. You got strong at the end, and I think it has to be a last desperate begging, and I still think you shouldn't jump on every single emphatic line. It looks fake. It really does, Shelley. I'm telling you, it's too many times. Every time he speaks emphatically, you're jumping, and it looks phony. Duvall mm-hmm. tried to have an impact on the lines, changing them to suit her interpretation of the character. I honestly don't think the lines are going to make an awful lot of difference if you get the right attitude, Kubrick told Duvall. I think you're worrying about the wrong thing. Kubrick continued to work on the attitude by maintaining pressure on the actress to portray true nervousness and fear in her situation. Jeez. He worked her. Yeah. Uh, it is a haunting performance by Shelley. Without a doubt. Yeah, it's, un- it's unsettling. Well, now, so let's, let's hear her side of it. Duvall told Vivian Kubrick 
that the end ultimately justified the means and the quality of the finished film. She said, if it hadn't been for that volley of ideas and sometimes butting of heads together, it wouldn't have come out as good as it did. And it also helps get the emotion up and the concentration up because it builds up anger, actually. You get more out of yourself. And he knew that. He knew he was getting more out of me by doing that. So it was sort of like a game. You mm -hmm. just appreciate all the pain and you always dislike whatever the cause of, is of pain. You always resent it. So I resented Stanley at times because he pushed me and it hurt. I resented him for it. I thought, why do you want to do this to me? How can you do this to me? You agonize over it and it's just the necessary turmoil to get out of it what you want out of it. We had the same end in mind. It was just that sometimes we differed in our means and by the end, the means met. I really respect mm -hmm. him both as a person and as a director. I'm amazed. He's taught me more than I've learned on all the other pictures I've done within one year's time on one picture. Wow. Stanley pushed, pushed me and prodded me further than I've ever been pushed before. It's the most difficult role I've ever had to play. But Stanley makes you do things that you never thought you could do. Robert Altman says, I am a changed artist since I worked with Kubrick. If Stanley hadn't pushed me as hard as he did, I would never have produced the performances I did. I never thought it was possible. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so it's worth, I mean, it's worth it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, she said it was. I mean, and, and yeah. Scatman Crothers loved it. He said mm. he just, he had a blast. He was so happy to be on the set. So wait, uh, who, is, who did Scatman? Who Scatman is? plays the cook. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, he was a great, that's a great role. That's a oh, great character. Incredible. Yeah. One of my favorite moments is, is when it zooms into his bachelor pad in Florida yeah. or wherever he is. And it, <laughs> he has all the sexy, uh, yes. strong sisters up on the wall and all that. Right. I, it's just so jarring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, this is, this yeah. is taking me into a different world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah you what, know, a great, what a great film. Yeah. Incredible. It's probably the most ex is it the most accessible Kubrick film? That's a good question. I, I think it depends on whether you like war or you yeah. like psychology and psychological war. Right. If, yeah. you, if you're a war person... Because actually Full Metal Jacket's actually pretty accessible. Yeah, it might yeah. be. It might yeah. be more... It, I think it depends on what you're, what you're into. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's fair. Well, so he had a... And we're coming down to the last two films here. And I think you can see how I've structured this where I don't, there's no way to separate Kubrick, the man from Kubrick, the filmmaker. No, no and for sure. Well, so, if that's all, that's all he did. Yeah. Was I, make these movies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He, and he, and he did it with his family and he constructed yeah. the kind of life that I think most every artist would be envious of. I mean, at this mm -hmm. point he's already living in uh, the, the second house. So in 78, he's moved into Childwickbury Manor in Hertfordshire, UK. And it's a mainly 18th century building, but it has all sorts of extra, uh, uh, if you look at a picture of it, it's clear that it's been built and added on to, and then it goes mm. all the way back to the middle ages. And then it was mostly built in the 18th century, but then it has some modern additions. It's very uh -huh. Stanley. It's yeah. very, uh, you see it in the documentary. It's very interesting. Hmm. Um, and it's about 30 miles north of, north of London. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can you beat that? I mean, yeah. just an incredible thing. It gave him energy, inspiration, and confidence, one of his colleagues said. And he had a great psychological uh, climate. He had privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I neglected to mention that during 2001, at one point, he carried around a knife, like a hunting knife, in his briefcase because there was some lunatic who oh my God. Uh, applied for a job on the film and would not leave and perched mm. himself out on a park bench day after day. Uh, so Kubrick, I think it's fair to say that Kubrick's films were strong enough to inspire that kind of reaction. And yeah. I don't think we can blame him for moving to a manor 30, 30 minutes outside yeah. of London. Yeah. Um, no harm in that. Yeah. Um, well, so this is a, a fun fact about one of the great shots in The Shining. I don't know how many times uh, they shot the blood in the elevator. Somebody told me they had been shooting that ever since the shoot first started the year before. They shot it three times while I was there. About every 10 days, they would shoot it again. And Stanley would say, it doesn't look like blood. And they would say, well, is it the texture? Is it the color? It would take them like nine days to set the shot up. And then they would come back. The door would open. It would come out. And Stanley would say, it doesn't look like blood. But finally, they got it. 
Oh, I man. didn't surprise me that he's like, all right, what we got to do is we have to actually get blood. Right. So, right. Yeah. Call the magician. Right. <laughs> Call the magician. Get, we need a, we need like a pig farmer out here. I don't know what we need, but incredible. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if I'm not mistaken, the, the anecdote I heard is that, uh, Stephen King didn't really like the shining yeah. initially, but he warmed up to it later. Well, they remade, they made a mini series in like the late nineties with that dude from wings in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was supposed to be like truer to Stephen King's vision, but it was awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think Stephen King, I think people came around to that film. Um, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to look at how it was received. Uh, I did have the, the pleasure at the Sewanee Writers Conference. I did meet Diane Johnson briefly, who co-wrote the screenwriting or the uh, screenplay of The Shining. Oh, really? And I, I mentioned it to her and she said it was all, it was all Stanley. It was all the master. Really? Yeah. yeah she was very modest about it. But yeah. uh, she, she notes that this is a Diane Johnson. He really liked sharing his work with his family. They all worked mm-hmm. together, creating art mm-hmm. and film on the kitchen table, so to speak. He That's was in cool. no way an isolated individual. He never excluded his family from what he was doing. That's really cool. I love yeah. that. I think that's yeah. fantastic. That to me is very inspiring. Yeah. Do you yeah. know? The family business, man. It's, that's it's like it. If, yeah. He took it seriously. It's like, we, you know, if we're uh, anything, you know, we're a mm-hmm. landscaping company. We're a uh, this, mm-hmm. we're that. That's yeah. What we all do. I love that. Yeah. That's really uh, cool. the, the response was mixed. Uh, it seems like he did that. It seems like he divided critics and yeah. uh, it earned $1 million in the first weekend and then 30 million by the end of the year. Uh, yeah. So I think it, it did very well, The Shining. Uh, and of course now it's considered to be an absolute classic. I watch yeah. it. I watch it every year. Yeah. Uh, and that came out, what year did The Shining came out? 1980. Oh really? Okay. So now we're into the eighties and yeah. we have one more film in the eighties before the final opus, uh, which is, Maybe one of my, it's definitely one of my, one of my favorites, but we have the great Vietnam war film, mm. uh, full metal jacket. What do you, what are your opinions about full metal jacket, Brad? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, 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 uh, as a Vietnam film specifically, it is probably in my opinion, I mean the best, mm. um, you know, apocalypse now is in some competition, but, uh, but not really by much. I think if you're actually looking for something that's about Vietnam specifically, I think Full Metal Jacket's actually better. It, it takes you through the whole, the whole psychological experience of the war, really, from every from most perspectives that it could have. Um, Vincent uh, Vincent D'Onofre. D'Onofrio, right? Oh my God, that's incredible! I didn't, you know, I watched that movie like three times when I was like in my early twenties, and then like later came to know Vincent D'Onofrio and then re like, you know, retconned like, Oh my God, that was him. Yep. What? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and he manages to steal the film somehow. Yeah. And he's not the protagonist no. and he's not even in the latter two thirds of the film. Yeah. He's only, it's just such an intense, impactful performance. Uh, yeah, no, that whole movie is great. I mean, you got Arlie army or whatever that guy's name is. Uh, Ermy. Yeah, Ermy. Ermy. Yeah. We're going to talk about this. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah a quote quote from um, Matthew Modine. I don't know what you've read about Stanley, but the impression I got was that he was this crazy lunatic who was afraid of germs and flies. It's just not true. Um, and then Matthew Modine again. He's probably the most heartfelt person I ever met. It's hard for him being from the Bronx with the neighborhood mentality, and he tries to cover it up. Right underneath that veneer is a very loving, conscientious man who doesn't like pain, who doesn't like to see human suffering or animals suffering. I was really surprised by the man. So that's a nice endorsement of him. I mean, again, this is Art of yeah. Darkness. I think we've pointed at some of the, some of the darker sides of, uh, yeah. of, uh, of Kubrick. Uh, I mean, that performance from, from D'Onofro is incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an actor named um, Spiridakis, and he worked with Kubrick on the film. Uh, and I have, a, I have some thoughts from him. This, this, I think, is very moving because he was, this actor was cast um, 
in a sequence in a portion of the film that was ultimately cut. Mm. Uh, and Kubrick, after the film was edited, Spiridakis was cut out of it. Now I'm trying to imagine what that must feel like. That would suck. It's Kubrick, and it's, it's yeah. he's, this is the guy who made 2001 and A Clockwork yeah. Orange, and you just worked with him. Yeah. So Kubrick called him and told him. He called me and said there was a 50% chance I would be out of the film, and he was very sorry. That's mm. how he did it. He didn't let me go to the movie and find out. I really appreciated it. A friend of mine is friendly with his daughter, and Vivian said how much her dad hated cutting me out and that he adored me. I adored him. Mm. He knew how hard it was for me to get cut out, and he felt really terrible. I have a soft spot in my heart, even though it devastated me. What happened was unavoidable, and he was a complete gentleman. He showed me uh, that we ha- he showed that we had a connection. I couldn't have asked to be treated better than that. Hmm. So there was this whole second passage where I think the the Matthew Modine character uh, goes into the jungle hmm. and becomes even more disillusioned. But apparently, it wasn't necessary because the whole boot camp experience was disillusioning enough. Hmm. Uh, but that's, that's something a longish film, anyway. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's something to take away. Um, this same actor said of Kubrick, after 10 or 12 takes, he would say, let's go for a walk. And we go for a walk. Like an athlete, you could only go so far and then you needed to pull back. We'd talk and talk about different actors. The whole process of filmmaking was just in his blood. There are very few people you ever meet in any profession who can go as hard and yet be as centered. On one level, you want to be the ultimate competitive person. And on the other level, you want to be a Buddha and be non-result oriented. So that's a very big contradiction. It could tear someone apart. But Stanley had that ability to go hard all the time, but still be centered. He's like a kid, Mm. but sophisticated as an old wise man. He's both of these things. He would lean his head against your shoulder and close his eyes rather than go to a trailer. He's very in love with the process of acting and the physical process of filmmaking. Hmm. Mm. So just again, painting a picture. Yeah. Uh, they talked about how the, the unit became the, the actors became like a, um, like a military unit. Sure. Um, and all the rest of it. It's interesting because at this point, getting into his personal life as we're, as we're winding down here, he lost both of his parents. Um, while he was doing this. So his mother died at 82 years old and during full metal jacket during full metal jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, his father died six months later, uh, at 83 and pretty, pretty sad to think about that. Although, I mean, he, he did get to see them live to a good old age. You wonder if that, you know, if that might've affected it. And then it is interesting after, after full metal jacket, he does have a long hiatus. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Maybe he took some time. I, I, it's pure speculation. Um, yeah. Incredible. Uh, I love this idea of him being the guy who, who does all of the, all of the possible takes just take after take after take after take. Um, it seems to, it seems to fit. Um, well, so Full Metal Jacket, yeah, again, is one of the, one of the greatest war films you can watch. Uh, and Absolutely. that was released in uh, 1987. Let me just see here. Yeah, Lee Ermey is the character who yep. wasn't Lee Ermey. I believe he was an actual... He, uh, I think he was originally a drill sergeant, and then he kind of made a little bit of an acting career for himself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he had like a reality TV show for a little while where he... I don't know, some kind of military thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I wonder, I have to, I have to look it up because we've been doing this. I, I really wonder what the, Oh, interesting. Uh, at one point he shut down production for five months following a near fatal accident with a Jeep involving Lee Ermey. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I wonder what happened. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, what a great performance. I mean, you, Oh, it's you, fantastic. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. From, from that guy. I mean, yeah. you, you just, cannot. I, my understanding is that Lee Ermey came up with a lot or, or a lot of that was his insults. I don't know if it was stuff that had been used sure. in the military before, probably a lot of it, but right. Yeah. I think I that mean, there. I why think write your own? Some, you have a literal drill sergeant there to do it. You know, right, right. Yeah. It looks like the reviews for this were pretty, pretty good, but not all were were positive. Uh, apparently, yeah. Roger Roger Ebert called it strangely shapeless, which I think is maybe a little, hmm. a little, um, 
kind of missing the point. It's so interesting because these films over time just just hold up so much. Yeah. Uh, it's just they're, they just seem to be definitive for a certain view. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, and of course, everybody, the me so horny, me love you long time. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, in they, pop culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every every one of these movies, maybe not Barry Lyndon, but most of these, most of his films, especially in the sort of the four, they have something that people say, mm-hmm. even now, it's like an mm-hmm. offhand comment, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, what's wrong, Dave? Yeah, yeah. And exactly. you just immediately know, you, just, <laughs> yeah. you could just see how. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very interesting. You 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 made a point about Barry Lyndon, which is well taken. Which it's it kind of is a film missing an iconic moment. It, People a have, little bit, and that has got to be intentional. Mm. Has to be. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Uh, he, it's all iconic. It's all mm. like a like a Renaissance painting come to mm. life, mm. right? Mm. Um, so I have a few quotes from John Milius, who he was a friend with. Uh, and then we'll wind down with with uh, Eyes Wide Shut. So, John, you know who John Milius is? Uh, name rings was, a bell, but I don't know who he is. He was a writer and director. He wrote Apocalypse Now. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. He, he very famously wrote the Indianapolis speech for Jaws. He's not credited on that. Mm-hmm. Um, Red Dawn, I think, was his okay. uh, film of his. Uh, he was kind of a right-wing director. He got, ended up kind of getting kicked out of Hollywood for that. Um, mm. He was very vulnerable to criticism or to whether a movie was a success or not. He wasn't completely comfortable with Barry Lyndon. He just felt that people didn't understand it. People were bored by it. I think after that picture, he felt no one was going to let him make a film again, which is so sad to think, right? Yeah. Apparently, the only thing that really bothered him a great deal was that Barry Lyndon failed commercially. He made The Shining after that. Nicholson, I remember at the time, said, I'm glad to be off that one. That was rough duty. (laughs) And here's a full metal jacket. Uh, when he did Dr. Strangelove, the Air Force contacted him afterwards and all the big shots of Strategic Air Command and General LeMay wanted to talk to him. And he was afraid of going to see them. He was afraid they'd be angry with him, that they would do something to him. <laughs> so this paranoia quality yeah, comes back. Yeah. I said, Stanley, how can you have been that paranoid? They wanted to honor you. Mm-hmm. They love Dr. Strangelove. He said, I know it's crazy. I wish I'd gone to Washington to see them. He loved military history and just consumed it all the time and said, I feel perfectly safe in my love of war and military history because I know that I am a devout coward. (laughs) He was endlessly fascinated by honor and valor, the regimental esprit de corps. I'd never go to war, he said, but I'd like to experience it if I knew I wasn't going to get hurt. Right. (laughs) (laughs) There's something sort of sweet about that, like admitting like, no, 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 I'm a coward. Not for me. I like to be behind the camera and we can pretend. Right. Uh, right, This is another quote from Emilius. Um, uh, Stanley had no regard for time. He'd call you in the middle of the night, whatever he felt, whenever he felt like calling, I'd say, Stanley, it's the middle of the night. He'd say, you're awake, aren't you? He'd never talk for less than an hour. He just had all kinds of things to discuss, everything. He had theories. He felt most film was fraudulent. He felt most people who made films were frauds. He was fascinated by the idea of pure film as opposed to just narrative storytelling. He felt that film broke down to just getting the story across like an episodic TV show. And then you have, on the other hand, something that's like the end of 2001, though I think he felt that sort of failed, that it wasn't exact enough. Christian, his wife, talked about how many films he would watch. He really liked Bergman, Woody Allen, Spanish, Italian, Japanese films. He also loved to hate certain films. He would say, this is the most awful thing I've ever seen and keep watching. <laughs> so there he is. It's, it's yeah. Kubrick's, what are yeah. the uh, eye locks or right. what are they called? Uh, Lidlocks. Lidlocks, yeah. 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 Stanley Kubrick's yeah. Lidlocks. Yeah. Uh, I love that. So Stanley yeah. Kubrick was the original uh, hate watcher. Right. Just just watch it. Start it from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. got some more, co- some more quotes here. Uh, I, I mean, we're already this far in. Let's go. Yeah. Christian said, uh, socially, he was very much in American and Europe and did astonishing things that were very endearing. I think he was quite unaware of certain social games that people play, especially mm. in England, and wasn't interested either. And I think many people found that very nice. He was quite secure. If he wasn't, mm. he would inform himself very carefully and very pedantically set out uh, not to make a mistake. Mm. Uh, I like that idea of social games in England. Uh, having spent a little bit of time over there, I think that everybody knows what that looks like. It's kind mm. of a, there's maneuvering and you're very, very obsessed with status. Who knows mm. who and how are they related and who dated whom when and what does it look like? Yeah. Mm. Uh, Milius would um, 
Oh, this is good. So this gets back to one of your original points about the sort of anal quality of his work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before Full Metal Jacket, he quizzed uh, Milius, uh, Milius saying, he quizzed me a lot about Southeast Asia. I said, you're never going to go anywhere near Southeast Asia. But he wanted to know every little detail, what the food was like, how the airport was, whether they lost your baggage. He was preparing himself as if he would go. We turned him on to a supplier of military equipment that was going to get him uniforms and patches and all that kind of stuff. This guy in Oklahoma City, great character. He called me and said, I'm so proud to be working on the Stanley Kubrick film. And I thought (laughs) six months later, the guy was ready for a medal. Stanley just drove him nuts. Are you sure the color of these patches is the same as the last batch? I've been looking at them and I can see a difference. (laughs) <laughs> so this guy in Oklahoma City is like, yeah. wow, I get to work right. with Stanley oh, Kubrick. Boy. Oh boy. <laughs> and now you're getting you're getting these calls from England, these long distance calls, yeah. and you have to wonder yeah. how much they cost, and Stanley doesn't care. And right, right, right. right <laughs> he's gonna right. give you an ear beating because the colors are slightly different. Yeah. This one looks burgundy, and I think the last ones were maroon, and you're just like, it's three o'clock in the morning. What do you <laughs> Well, we have to before we get off. Full Metal Jacket, we have to address that stuff um, that you talked about before with D'Onofro. So this is Mm -hmm. Lee Ermey, who was a a Marine veteran. Mm -hmm. Stanley told me he didn't understand actors. He had no actor friends. They were basically working associates, and he thought they were a little bit strange, totally spoiled, and in most cases had to be begged to give him a decent performance. Prop City, actors of Prop City. Half the time, the actor would argue with him. Uh, D'Onofro didn't like Stanley's craziness look. He wanted to try it some other way. The problem with Vince was this was his first film. Can you imagine Vincent from yeah. That was his first film. That's He's wild. a great follow on Twitter. I really love that guy. I respect him. Oh, that. I should follow him. I don't Yeah, follow, follow him. him. He's, he, yeah. he writes poetry sometimes. He's okay. very free. He's okay. just great. Um, so Vince, uh, the problem with Vince was that this was his first film, and he's telling Stanley Kubrick how he thinks his look should be. They stand there arguing. Stanley finally said, look, do it my way, and we'll load back up, and we'll shoot it your way. Hmm. Well, when they shot it, Vince's way, they didn't have any film in the camera. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so the chess, the chess game has continued all the way into the uh, 80s here. We're still yeah, playing. See, yeah. Yeah. You would think, though, that Kubrick might every once in a while come up to a character who sort of acts like he did and be like, you know what? Maybe I will give this old Vince D'Onofrio a chance. Yeah, you know, I think game well, recognized game a little bit. I, I, you know, I think it, yeah. he was a young actor and he needed a very specific thing out of him. Yeah, um, yeah this is interesting. So this is Louis Blau. I have to look up who that is. I just want to make sure I credit the person. Oh, he's a he was a lawyer for Kubrick. Um, uh, Stanley told D'Onofrio the night before the scene, the big scene in the bathroom. I want Mm -hmm. you to be big, uh, Lon Chaney big. They shot Mm -hmm. the scene in three takes, and as they sat playing back the tape, Vincent and Stanley were seated next to each other. And after the third take was seen, Stanley took his fist and gently rubbed it against Vincent D'Onofro. Vincent has never forgotten that. It was the (laughs) approval from Kubrick. Mm -hmm. Why? I think think they said it it took a week to light that scene. Yeah, I can imagine. I yeah. mean, that seems ridiculous, but <laughs> it is an iconic scene. I mean, that was one of the most affecting scenes I've come across. In you, the film. It burns into your mind's eye. Yeah. You can see Lee Ermey falling back from being shot. You can see yeah. Vincent, Vincent's uh, look of yeah. mania. You can mm-hmm. see Matthew Modine begging for his life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just stunning. Yeah. Lee Ermey said uh, of that work, he said he didn't seem to be too concerned if the people got hurt, but, but if an animal got hurt, that's serious stuff there. He wouldn't kill a mouse in his house. One afternoon on location, we needed to use an area where there was a big stack of rubbish, lumber and junk, and Stanley asked construction to move that pile of rubbish somewhere else, and in the process, they killed a wild rabbit, and it broke mm. Stanley's heart. He actually uh, wrapped for the rest of the day, shut it down over a whoa. day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. W- very unexpected. Huh. huh. Mm. Yeah, it is unexpected. Well, here's another uh, quote, and then we will get to Eyes Wide Shut and the end of the, the, the story. So this is um, uh, a VP for Warner Brothers. This is Steve Southgate. We have a lady in France who supervises all the dubbing for Stanley. And she was heavily pregnant at the time, and she got everything virtually finished. 
the dubbing was done, the mixing was all done, and she went into labor. And she was in labor for 10 to 12 hours, and Kubrick called her in the middle of the labor, and she was screaming the answers back. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is a guy who doesn't have boundaries when it comes no, to his doesn't own care. films. Yeah. and doesn't have boundaries um, yeah. Uh, yeah. with his own work, and this kind of monomania and this uh, intensity yeah. to his work. Now, we have a period where he takes... Yeah a decade away from making yeah. film before yeah. he would finally pick up uh, Arthur Schnitzler's Traum novel, uh, dream novel or dream story in order to make the final film. Have you read Traum novel? I have not. No. Yeah. It, it yeah. has the germ of what, what you can sort of see became eyes wide shut. It's certainly mm-hmm. not a one-to-one. Uh, yeah. And of course, eyes wide shut is, is updated to the modern world. I, I think eyes wide shut like his other films uh, has become more palatable and in a way more germane uh, uh, over time as yeah. we, as we've had to accept that uh, human trafficking lizard people uh, <laughs> seem to run international affairs. Right. Uh, I think after the Epstein scandal and all of that business, rewatching Eyes Wide Shut is something that that everyone should do. One of my favorite criticisms of Eyes Wide Shut that I once heard is, that doesn't look like New York. It looks (laughs) nothing like, and you go, you're completely missing the point. I mean, this thing is called Eyes Wide Shut. You don't know, is he dreaming? Is he awake? Right. It probably, if he wanted it to look like New York, he would have gone to New York and shot it in New York. It wasn't yeah. a matter of convenience. It wasn't a matter. Of, it was a choice. Right. right. So ask right. yourself why, why he would make that choice. Right. And what you're really watching. Um, yeah. what, what's your impression of Eyes Wide Shut, Brad? I mean, it definitely, the fact, the, the book it's, it's based on is called The Dream Novel mm-hmm. in translation. I mean, that makes sense because there is a sort of a dreamlike quality to it. Um, I think when I first saw it, I, I had somehow come under the impression that it was sort of, you know, sometimes an artist towards the end of their career, they kind of, they kind of phone one in, you Mm -hmm. know, the Mm -hmm. last work isn't always so great. And I kind of thought it was that, and I thought it was sort of sensationalized because of there's, you know, some fairly explicit scenes, um, and then sat down to watch it and was like, this is maybe the best psychological thriller I have ever seen in my life it's just it every it's yeah it's it's intense and it gets you by something between your heart and your balls and it just hangs on there until the end yes (laughs) yeah and it burrows into your brain if i if i mention the masked ball you can see it yes here yeah and but the relationship between tom cruise and nicole kidman is really the thing that really like it's hard to watch like mm. i've never felt i've never felt such jealousy watching a film like mm. reverberated with the jealousy of a character that deeply mm. Yeah, so I don't yeah. know. It's, it's all well, well done. So for but it, Q- it's not just mm-hmm. jealousy because it's not like he's in a jealous rage. It's that jealous but not wanting to act jealous. It's the weird dynamic, right. give and take dynamic, right? right? Am I being tested? How, right. how far does this go? Yeah. You know, for Kubrick, this film is really a return to his roots. He, he sets it in, much of it is set in Greenwich Village in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, Schnitzler was Austrian. He was, you know, he was Viennese okay. Jew. And yeah. so... There is a quality uh, there that he's playing with. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to read from some people about this okay. uh, film. So Sidney Pollack, who plays the uh, the playboy uh, man with the mansion, who hosts mm-hmm. the, the holiday party, uh, mm-hmm. who ultimately reveals to Dr. Bill that he's in serious trouble. Um, said, my initial take on my part in Eyes Wide Shut was very different from what Stanley wanted. I came in with the idea of being tougher with the character of Tom Cruise because he had done something that I disapproved of strongly. And then Stanley had an idea of my wanting to manipulate him more and therefore be kinder. And he was very specific about how to communicate that. He knew I was another director. Uh, He didn't have to beat around the bush. He wasn't trying to work any psychological tricks with me. And he was crazy about both Tom and Nicole. 
I always think of Stanley literally on the edge of a smile. His eyes always had mischief in them. He always had this sense of the devil in him while he was very calmly asking questions. He read everything and knew absolutely all aspects of the business, including literally what the box office receipts of every theater in the world were over the past few years. Pollock going on, Cruz woke me up on Thursday morning to tell me how great he thought the picture was. I called Stanley and we talked for an hour and a half or so, and I told him how thrilled Tom was. Then I spoke with Terry and Bob Daly, co-chairman of uh, War- uh, Warner Brothers, and they were absolutely ecstatic. And four days later, he died. Oof. Steve Southgate. Two days before he died, he sent me over to Las Vegas with the first trailer of Eyes Wide Shut for the Show West convention. And as it was the first time ever that anyone was going to see anything from the movie, he wanted to make sure that the projection was perfect. He gave me specific instructions. We had to clear the room at three o'clock in the morning, make sure everybody was gone, and just the projectionist and I rehearsed it. The last conversation I had was, I trust you to go and do this in Vegas. Let me know how everybody reacts. Ring me during the screening. Take your mobile phone. I want to hear what the reaction is. And while I was on the plane, he died. Wow. Uh, I have more quotes that I think are, are kind of wonderful. Of course, he had to censor this movie slightly for America because of the yeah. prudishness of American audiences and censors. Uh, yeah. it, people, it was billed as a very, I remember when it came out, I saw it in the theater here in Minneapolis, and it was billed as kind of this very uh, sexy movie, and people were disappointed, right. you know, and you would go, well, of course, they got your butt in the seat. Right. And, um, uh, you know, so this is uh, Terry Semmel. He was with Warner Brothers. I had talked to him two different times the day he died. He had called. See, this is another thing about Kubrick. You have to imagine he was on the phone a lot, like a president probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he had called me for about an hour apiece, and he was in great spirits. And his second call, which would have been the early evening of the night he actually died, was really to kind of review millions of details on the marketing. He was more outspoken and more excited than I think I had ever heard him, than his wife. Mm. I thought he was awfully tired and he never slept much ever in his whole life. Then I thought he was really overdoing it with this last film, sleeping less and less. He also was a doctor's son and he wouldn't see a doctor. He gave himself his own Mm. medicine if he wasn't feeling well or he would phone friends. It was the one thing he did that I thought was really stupid. Mm. Um, Now. So what was it? uh, I believe he passed from a, from a heart uh, from a heart condition. Um, and how old would he have been then? He would have been. He would. He died in 1999 at the age of 70. Oh, yeah. So not really that old, actually. Yeah, it was a heart attack. Yeah. He was, uh, and we're not um, blaming or anything, but he yeah. he was a lifelong smoker, a very oh, serious okay. smoker. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. So I have a few more quotes, but I'm going to read this on March 7th. 1999, six days after screening a final cut of Eyes Wide Shut for his family and the stars, Kubrick died in his sleep at the age of 70, suffering a heart attack. His funeral was Mm -hmm. held five days later at Childwickbury Manor with only close friends and family in attendance, totaling approximately 100 people. The media were kept a mile away outside the entrance gate. I'm sure they hated that. Yeah. Alexander Walker, who attended the funeral, described it as a family farewell, almost like an English Mm -hmm. picnic with Mm. cellists, clarinetists, and singers providing song and music from many of his favorite classical compositions. Kaddish, the Jewish prayer, typically said by mourners in another context, was recited. Uh, A few of his obituaries mentioned his Jewish background. Hmm. Uh, He he did receive eulogies from a number of people, including Steven Spielberg, Nicole Kidman, and Tom Cruise. Of course, he had the project AI, uh, which he had worked on for many years, and which Spielberg finally... uh, directed Mm -hmm. he was buried next to his favorite tree on the estate Mm -hmm. uh and i love this Uh, this will come full full circle in her book dedicated to kubrick his wife christian included one of his favorite quotations of oscar wilde Mm. the tragedy of old age is not that one is old but that one is young Mm. Mm. and uh so apparently they got permission from the local authorities to have his grave in the garden And in Hertfordshire, this was only the second time, presumably in modern history. The first Mm -hmm. person they let be buried in their own garden was Bernard Shaw. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, that's Uh, the league he's in. Well, honestly, I kind of feel like Bernard Shaw's in his league. Right, right. Well, peers, comparable. Peers, for sure. I have a few more quotes from his his, uh, school friend, Gerald Freed. He said, I hope his last hour was cool. 
I like this because this is very humanizing. I played mm. on a ball club called the Barracudas in the Bronx baseball. And I remember Stanley, he was about 18 or 19. He wanted to get into a game and he wasn't a good athlete. And the guys <laughs> didn't want him. And I said, come on, give him, a, give him a chance. We let him play and his face lit up. Mm. I think that's sort of beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and I think he probably carried a grudge his whole life. I mean, he definitely yeah. reached an incredible height. Um, yeah. And... Uh, Yeah. His wife said even the most ordinary things, he would give them such extra insight that they became interesting. And I think you see that in all of his films, the magic of every shot, every Mm -hmm. bit of framing, every object. Does this patch match the other patches? Uh, All of that, you know, that he, that, mm -hmm. yeah, that is one thing I've taken from him artistically. And I think I took this early on, you know, in my ventures into writing was like, everything matters. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, everything matters. Everything matters. Yeah. yeah. Well, his yeah. wife went on to say he talked all the time. And so, and this is sad for her. And so I now mm-hmm. never have this reign of words. It's very sad mm-hmm. now, but I was personally very lucky that I always felt very loved. And many people can't say that. So I, I don't mm-hmm. think that we can really say he had this horrible reputation as a womanizer, three wives. I mean, I think he was just finding himself and figuring things out with the first two. I, uh, that, yeah. And three he, wives when you married yeah. one at 18 and right. had an incredible, unpredictable life that nobody would have. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give the last quote to Sidney Pollack. People say that he had these phobias. He wouldn't go here and wouldn't go there. The truth is he lived in a paradise. There wasn't any reason for him to go anywhere. It was a kind of heaven. Mm. So, there you have it. The life of uh, yeah. Stanley Kubrick, who's influenced everybody. Scorsese, yeah. Spielberg, Wes Anderson, George Lucas, uh, James Cameron, Terry Gilliam, mm-hmm. the Coen brothers, Ridley Scott, George Romero, everybody, David Fincher, Christopher Nolan, David Lynch, yeah. everybody. everybody. Everybody was influenced by Kubrick. Even if they don't hold him in his high esteem as probably I do, uh, mm. you, you undeniably have to recognize that you're dealing with a genius who played chess his entire life. Even when he he was on set working with actors, (laughs) Uh, he was always hustling and uh, you know, winning those quarters in order to get the performances that he did and all the rest of it. Brad, I hope you enjoyed that. That was great. (laughs) I was very intimidated by this, but I've had, I've had a fun couple of weeks. I moved house so yeah. Yeah. I was very busy with that, but now I'm settled into my own little no. estate. Hopefully it doesn't burn to the ground soon in the, in the coming riots. Right, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got your riot insurance, right? I do. I got my riot insurance right here, Brad. Click, <laughs> click. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, no, that was great, Kevin. I that'll pre- play that really was, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you think, and this is the, the end question we always do mm. with uh, – Art of Darkness. You can find us at artofdarkpod.com. We're on Patreon if you want to support independent media. We're doing two of these a month. We're really doing some deep dives into artists. If you're into that, support the show. We're on Twitter. You can find me at Kevin Kautzman. Brad's at, at Brad Kelly. The show is at, at Art of Dark Pod. But we like to ask uh, the other host when we're presenting, what do you think Kubrick is doing now? Mm. if he's alive now what do you think he's doing i I mean i think he's still in film and i think he's still i mean i don't think he's running a twitter account though maybe uh photographs or something like that Mm. i would have liked to see him in the milieu of television actually being good Mm. so like what would it mean for kubrick to shoot a season of something that wow. that's really allowed to sort of play out and i don't know Ooh. what that project would be well that could have been his napoleon project. that could have been napoleon can right? you imagine if hbo had grabbed him i don't think he yeah. would have ever stooped to that yeah because i don't think he would have well no but if he was alive today now he might fincher right with uh mind hunter yeah that's yeah. a great point yeah, yeah oh my god i mean yeah he could have realized his napoleon project with hbo right. or something right well and he had a tendency i mean Barry Lyndon's three hours and you know he didn't he wasn't shy about making something long so giving him eight to to eight to twelve hours to play would have been um a gift I think I don't know what do you think he'd be doing he'd be making movies he'd be making film yeah Yeah. uh I don't know what his subject would be I'm trying to think of the trajectory because of course he had uh full metal jacket war Mm -hmm. was a big subject for him so he may have he may have done something about Afghanistan or Iraq yeah yeah, uh, that he just been, missed mm-hmm. the internet, right? He's mm-hmm. like the last 
like the, maybe not the last, but literally, I mean, I don't know about you, yeah. but first time I got on the internet was 1998. He died right. in 1999. So right. just all you that. have to wonder, would he be dealing with that? Um, mm-hmm. Would he have ended up making AI? I think Spielberg was already attached to it as a director beforehand, but he was going to yeah. be producing. I don't know the whole thing. I, I like to think that he would have completed the Napoleon project one way or yeah. another. Yeah. Uh, but if he was alive today, I mean, you have to imagine he'd be, the way that the Cold War was the obsession at the time, you'd have to think that he'd try to tackle the internet one way or another. I don't know what that would look like. He always worked from source material. Always. Even in the case of 2001, he hired, he he collaborated with a novelist to get a novel Mm -hmm. that would act as source material. Uh, So he always worked for somebody else's writing, somebody else's work, you know, so you wonder what books would he have on his radar? And it's it's tricky to say because every one of them was so different, right? You know, Clockwork Orange to The Shining to to um, Barry Lyndon, you know, it, it's hard to then say, oh, well, the obvious choice is this. It's there's no obvious choice. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's the nature of genius. One wonders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One wonders. But we have the body of work and we get to enjoy that. And, and it's uh, as yeah. good as anybody's. So. Well, uh, so this is uh, this has been Stanley Kubrick's Lidlock podcast, and you've been <laughs> listening to the Art of Darkness uh, podcast. And I'm Kevin Kautzman with uh, the great Brad Kelly. Brad, what's up next? Who are you doing? Who are you doing next? Franz Kafka. Kafka was a hack. <laughs> he was. He was. <laughs> he, he had some stuff right, but he had no idea what was coming. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's no, a joke, be, you know. We, but if if only <laughs> Kafka could see us now, we're all yeah. bugs now. That's right. That's 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 definitely right. So yeah, we're gonna dig into that. It should be a uh, uh, interesting. His body of work has got uh, just as high of a batting average, but uh, not as many at bats. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You know, he died at, died pretty young. So uh, we'll, all right, we'll dig, we'll dig into that and. Uh, my plan yeah, maybe... after after Kafka is uh, Virginia Woolf. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, all the all the hits. Yeah. I love Virginia Woolf. Right, I'm just gonna walk good. into the river, yeah. put stones oh. in my pockets, and walk into the river. That's my that's the ultimate retirement plan, right? <laughs> Who needs Dogecoin when you when you've got <laughs> when you can just drown yourself? Yeah, you just hit that day. You know, yeah. like, look at your watch. You know, yeah. only, I think uh, it's over. Oh yeah, and, Virginia yeah. should have invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be a really fun episode. I, it's been yeah. a while since I've read her stuff, and I really enjoy the, uh, the waves. And I, I, yeah. I recall really and really being fond of her writing. And uh, so that'll be a fun uh, yeah. piece. You know, I think it's interesting with Kubrick. We we avoided any pederasty. We yeah. avoided any um, whiff of scandal. Like the most scandalous yeah. thing is, wow, he was really hard on Shelley Duvall getting one right. of the greatest performances in the history of cinema. Yeah. It was all in service of the work for him. One does wonder how he would fare now under the new regime of uh, woke right. Me Too and everything, right? You have to be yeah. nice to everybody uh, all the time. Oh, One wonders what yeah. that would look like. And, yeah, well, yeah. it makes me think of that video that leaked of Christian Bale yelling at the lighting guy. Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, oh right. my God, you're so... And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, what the hell was that guy doing? Right. Like, <laughs> Get it right. Yeah. Get it right. You're here. We're on set. Time yeah. is money. Right. Let's right. go. We're making yeah. a movie. Yeah. Oh so, man, yeah, Christian Bale is great too. Christian yeah. Bale, his his body of work to date as an actor mm-hmm. parallels the quality of Kubrick's oh, work yeah, it's as phenomenal. a director, yeah. I would say. I'm a huge yeah. Christian Bale fan. Yeah. Uh all right, Brad. Well, now we're yeah. going to go and do, we're going to do a quick uh, 20, 30 minutes on Art of Darkness After Dark for the uh, Patreon subscribers. And if you want to support the show, find us on Twitter. It's at, of, uh, at Art of Dark Pod. And I believe we're at uh, patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. Uh, you can find us there. We would appreciate your support. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and uh, go and watch Paths of Glory. Mm. These movies are amazing. They're they worth, are. if you can't get them right out of the box, you know, if you can't, if they're not free to stream, pay for it because it's worth yeah. it. And if you don't yeah. know these movies, you should go back over them. They're iconic. Uh, and uh, even go on YouTube and watch The Day of the Fight. And you can see this early uh, vision of this, this person who is going to become a genius. Mm. All right. All right. All right. There you go. All right. Farewell, my droogies. (laughs) 